Buenos días to everyone. Good morning. Let me welcome you to this um, second CENIO Banco Sabadell Foundation workshop on philosophy, science, and medicine, an event funded by the Banco Sabadell Foundation. Uh, in May 2019, the three organizers of this workshop met in an event organized by the Museo San Telmo in San Sebastian with the occasion of, some, of an exhibition and a debate on death, aging, and transhumanism, in which the three of us, Maria Blasco, Antonio Diegez, and I, Aranta Echeverria, took part. This debate was intended to construct a bridge between science and philosophy on these topics, and we agreed that it is important to bring philosophy and science closer to each other. As a result of this, we organized our first workshop on science and philosophy, which took place in the CENIO, in the National Center for Oncological Research in November 2019, and had scientists and philosophers present and discuss together. For reasons we are all aware of, in November 2020, this second workshop needs to proceed with an online program in Zoom um, that we will probably enjoy, uh, hopefully, all of us. One of the main motivations of this workshop continues to be building bridges between philosophy and science and medicine. Philosophy is not only a special field within the broad domain of art and humanities, as it is often considered, but some philosophical traditions have played an important role within the sciences and in the analysis of their conceptual basis their methods and consequences. Philosophy needs then to cons be considered as an important fact actor within the sciences themselves, contributed, contributing in clarifying and organizing its contents. This is particularly evident in view of the increasing interdisciplinarity in which most scientific work needs to be carried on today. For the sake of the complexity of many of the topics being addressed, it is more and more important to include a philosophical view within those fields in interaction. Therefore, the three topics we have selected for this year's workshop are conceived from a perspective moving between philosophy and science and medicine. Each of the three sessions has a target topic, the first being research in cancer, the second, the influence of society and environment in health and disease, and the third, research on biodiversity and environment in matters of health and disease. Each of the three topics will be today addressed by a philosopher and by a scientist. And after the two presentations by the invited speakers, we will have some time for discussion open to the audience. The first topic concerns a disease, cancer, which is a very difficult condition for patients and families and communities and constitutes an enormous challenge for scientific research. This first session will mainly involve the personal level of disease, also zooming in the molecular and cellular factors that play a role in it, and addressing conceptual and clinical aspects related to this condition and its research. The second topic devoted to the social environmental factors of health and disease puts forward an important concern related to the causal impact social factors have had have in triggering disease, as well as in promoting health. The level of consideration here is a bit higher than the previous one, as the personal is considered in the context of tight interactions within communities and social environmental relations. This phenomena can also be researched in a range, range of levels, going from the molecular to population level. The third topic obliges us to zoom out still further into a global ecological consideration of health and disease related to the nature of ecological entities as well as to the important notion of biodiversity and its role for health and disease. At this level, personal matters will emerge and surface as being ultimately influenced by the state of the ecosystems of our whole planet and we may consider the extent to which people's health is related to the health of the whole earth and to non-human living beings such as 
plants, animals, fungi, microbes, etc. I finish this brief presentation here. I would like to remind you that uh, you can address your questions for the speakers and please participate. Uh, at the debate slot of each session after the presentations of, uh, of the scientists and the philosopher. And if you prefer so, you can also send your questions or your comments by email. Thank you very much to all of you for being here and to for participating in this uh, debate. It's important that you take part in, in, the, in, the, in the discussions uh, in each session. Uh, also, thank you to the Banco Sabadell Foundation for the funding that has made this possible, to the CENIO for hosting the event, and to the institutions in charge of the main affiliations of the organizers, the CENIO, the University of Malaga, and the University of the Basque Country. Now, Maria Blasco has the floor to start with the first uh, session. Good morning to all of you. Thank you very much, Arancha, for the very nice uh, welcome and introduction to the to the program of this year uh, symposium. So, as Arancha said, we are very happy that we can have the second the second um, symposium on science philosophy. Um, however, I mean, we are a little bit sad that we cannot do this in person, but uh, we hope that this will be equally exciting. And uh, so I think we can we can start. So the first topic, I will be the, the chair, and it has to do with the subject of uh, the study of this center, the Spanish National Cancer Center, which is cancer. Uh, but we will hear about cancer from, from different uh, perspectives. First, uh, we will have uh, Marta Bertolasso. Marta Bertolasso, she is in uh, the research unit of philosophy of science and human development at the Universita Campus Biomedico di Roma. Uh, and Marta, we will tell us about cancer from uh, an unusual point of view to, to researchers here at the CNIO. Uh, what is cancer? Which is the role of uh, cancer genes, cancer mutations, microenvironment, but from a philosophical point of view. So Marta, um, um, the floor is yours and uh, we will hear with interest what you have to, to tell us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. I really wanted to thank and congratulate the, organiza the organizers and the Banco Sabadell for funding a, a workshop like this because I think it is a very important timing and sometimes even urgent. I hope to contribute somehow to the overall discussion. I wanted to start sharing my presentation. And uh, um, yeah, I'm aware that uh, uh, people in the room are both scientists, uh, uh, physicians uh, and philosophers. So I will try to, um, uh, to use a, a middle level language, uh, still clear for both <laughs> uh, sides and uh, hopefully um, facilitating the debate uh, that uh, will follow. The, uh, I want, uh, first of all, uh, to clarify the perspective uh, I will uh, move uh, uh, from, uh, which is uh, the perspective of uh, philosophy of scientific practice, of science in practice, which uh, means uh, uh, both uh, looking at scientific practice and the functioning of science in practical realms of life. This means exploring concept theories and results produced by scientists and the processes by which they came to this conclusion. So in this uh, uh, talk, uh, I will uh, meet, I will discuss uh, uh, mainly five dimensions that I think uh, are important to understand uh, the kind of transition uh, that uh, is, uh, in my opinion, and the in opinion of many other people that are now taking place uh, in, in the field. The, the book uh, uh, you can see here uh, on this uh, slide uh, is a, a, a forthcoming book uh, published by MIT in which uh, we have contributed uh, with uh, a scientist uh, and uh, sometimes important names in the field like Mina Bissell, Sui Wang uh, and others. Uh, so my presentation will be mainly um, sharing with you, discussing with you the framework uh, we have been working on to um, gather people, to discuss people, to discuss issues for years, for five years, 
to come uh, up with this uh, uh, new book uh, that hopefully will contribute uh, to the field uh, in a wider sense. Okay, um, the scenario uh, that uh, other professor uh, will uh, probably uh, expand on uh, after my presentation is uh, like this, there are uh, concerns, there are also answers regarding the, um, um, the progress uh, in cancer research. Definitely there are, uh, um, after Nixon's, uh, Nixon declared in 1971, the war of Carson, of the war of cancer, it is uh, clear that we still uh, live uh, with the um, feeling that uh, there is a, a kind of complexity, let's use uh, this uh, word, uh, that is uh, uh, still uh, challenging. Uh, hmm? in cancer biology, our understanding of cancer biology, cancer research, uh, and our modeling of complex diseases like cancer is. These uh, will be the three levels uh, for the philosophers I will try to uh, argue mm, through uh, in this uh, presentation. I don't uh, uh, like uh, uh, um, negative uh, um, or pessimistic scenarios <laughs> um, uh, about cancer. What I'm suggesting, and this is part of the thesis of this uh, presentation, that more than uh, progress uh, as uh, understood uh, in traditional sense, especially in philosophy, I'm suggesting that we should talk about uh, uh, advancement. Uh, in concrete, uh, uh, advancement understood as a, a concerted change in epistemological assumptions and research practices, so that uh, there has been uh, a cumulative results of scientific practice uh, not a deliberate conceptual innovation aiming to develop a new explanatory paradigm that are currently preparing the ground for such paradigm shift. I wanted already, as you see, uh, to share my overall thesis to allow you, I hope, uh, to follow better my uh, presentation. If, uh, in fact, uh, if we look at the scientific literature instead of a philosophical uh, literature on a scientific pro process, uh, scientific progress, uh, sorry, uh, quote unquote, uh, we can see statements uh, uh, like uh, this. Uh, uh, Weinberg is very well known and I will use mainly his literature to look at uh, the dominant, uh, the still dominant paradigm, uh, conceptual paradigm. What uh, is emerging is that uh, after the initial reductionist triumphalism, uh, we are ending up uh, with this uh, sort of endless complexity. We are still uh, trying uh, to simplify to some extent because simplifications are part of a scientific progress as uh, we uh, know. What kind of simplification and what kind of complexity we should uh, um, uh, explore, we should uh, understand better is part of the question I wanted to uh, put on the table and to share and discuss with you today. So again, uh, these uh, are uh, uh, some kind of uh, scenarios I wouldn't like uh, to uh, endorse still, uh, they are uh, challenging the current uh, uh, status questions. Uh, and uh, also this uh, idea of a linear uh, uh, progressive account of science uh, has fallen. There has been a different uh, um, uh, alternatives uh, presented by philosophers like uh, the names you can find in these slides that uh, have talked more of progress, of paradigm shifts, of pluralism and uh, uh, integration, as uh, you well uh, uh, know. Now, this is uh, the uh, overall structure of uh, um, my, our proposal in that book uh, that will be published by MIT uh, around the, by the end of, of this year. Um, what uh, uh, let's follow first uh, the point one, two, three, four, and uh, five uh, because uh, uh, my point uh, is uh, precisely what I mentioned earlier that uh, what is important in scientific practice uh, is not uh, a sort of uh, deliberate uh, conceptual innovation, sometimes uh, generating contrasting and uh, opposing paradigm theories uh, in cancer uh, research. Uh, but uh, a sort of uh, cumulative results, empirical results, but also conceptual results that uh, are already mm, in the field uh, and uh, um, we can, uh, that we can consider in, in a wider sense to facilitate uh, this process, uh, this uh, transition of uh, overall paradigm, which 
is a sort of framework in which we can combine different kind of models uh, as we will uh, see. So let's uh, start with definition of cancer and uh, I will go very quickly through this first part uh, of the presentation because uh, you probably know very well uh, the kind of models uh, I'm presenting now, which are the genetic and epigenetic models. So this is uh, the genetic models so we, for which cancer is a, a, a result of a, a genetic mutation. So there is a, a transformation of a, a normal cells uh, towards a, a metastatic uh, state. This model was uh, very simple, uh, even uh, uh, simpler than uh, reductionists were uh, had there uh, to hope for. And uh, they started adding other elements like epigenetic factors uh, to this picture that is uh, still linear, mm, as you can see. And little by little adding molecular factors uh, in this linear conceptual framework uh, of uh, having different uh, changes at uh, molecular levels that drive uh, the transformation of a normal cells into a phenotypic uh, uh, in a neoplastic cell, mm? they came up with this kind of uh, scenario. So more or less reconstructing the overall complexity of uh, the cell, of its metabolism and so on. As uh, Einstein said, uh, make things as simple as possible, but not more. And uh, I think uh, that uh, all uh, the doctors, physicians and researchers uh, present in this uh, uh, workshop could probably uh, agree with uh, this uh, um, mantra uh, attributed to, to Einstein. But uh, what's uh, uh, the alternative therefore? Mm -hmm. Relevant processes. We in fact uh, started moving from uh, the search for molecular elements uh, to the identification of relevant processes involved in cancer. And this is another very probably familiar to all of you image in which uh, the authors uh, state uh, that uh, they now describe, uh, prefer to describe cancer and the phenotypic, uh, um, the uh, phenotype of a neoplastic uh, cell in terms of functional cap capabilities. As you can see, there is some kind, uh, some, a, a sort of a conceptual mm, a change that is not probably, of which uh, they were not so probably um, very aware. Mm. And uh, we can uh, say this uh, because uh, of what uh, they themselves uh, say in literature when talking about conceptual progress. Because uh, as you can see from this quote uh, and uh, having in mind uh, the image uh, um, above, which is uh, just the previous one uh, enriched with uh, other contextual environmental factors, uh, they are mainly referring, uh, uh, they are still mainly referring to other molecular factors that represent a different dimension than, for example, the genetic one. What I'm saying here is that uh, if we pay attention at the way they describe these processes uh, and these different elements that should describe at this point uh, the phenotypic, uh, the neoplastic phenotype, sorry, we still uh, have uh, characteristics uh, that are identified uh, and associated uh, to pharmacological strategies uh, or uh, um, feature characteristics that still uh, belong uh, to the level or scale uh, of observation that was uh, the molecular one, uh, that was still in the molecular, at the molecular, at the molecular level. We should, we have to work through molecules in, in, in science, but the problem is how we are really able to conceptualize and to find a new concept, a theoretical concept to uh, describe these molecular, these molecular elements. And I think this is the real scientific and also philosophical epistemological challenge we are facing with in, uh, in the field. So this, uh, we leave uh, this uh, uh, image on uh, uh, the discussion about uh, levels of uh, organization. And we have to say something about the environment because uh, it's clear that now the trend uh, is to consider the macro environment as uh, a key factor in uh, this kind uh, of uh, uh, transition, a conceptual therapeutical um, uh, research uh, tra transition. Mm -hmm. What is interesting for uh, uh, philosophers, maybe more than uh, scientists, is that uh, in this process that uh, it has been discussed in different papers uh, by, uh, published by myself, but uh, with many other authors, I would say at this point, uh, like uh, 
Anya Klutinsky, uh, Bechtel, uh, Sarah Green, uh, and uh, I think that many of the people around this table today are also contributing directly. Uh, Antonio and others right, are, are really actively um, contributing to, to this uh, agenda to understand better what it uh, actually means uh, to, um, to assist to see eh, this kind of, uh, um, of, a trend, of, uh, of trend, which is a progressive convergence mm, of the explananda mm, on a different uh, conceptual level, which is no further a genetic, as we understood it previously, factor but which is a wider understanding of how the biological information is actually embedded and embodied, I would say, both at the genetic, but also at the epigenetic, at the macroenvironmental, at the level of the organizational structure of an organ. I think that this is the huge and most important transition we are facing with and in which time, the organismic time, will play a fundamental role. Understanding, our understanding of organismic life, of the natural life of the organism and the cancer as a systemic disease of this natural life of the organism, so that of the developmental processes that are always involved in our ordinary healthy life is crucial. I won't have time to spend uh, um, more words about uh, this, uh, but definitely this is part uh, of the main thesis of that book. Uh, and the one of the question I would like to ask uh, the other speakers uh, today, if it will be possible. So uh, this, uh, um, so, uh, this convergence of uh, the explananda on this wider and more comprehensive uh, uh, concept uh, are also posing uh, um, epistemological question about uh, the explanantia, right? And uh, how the explanation in science are uh, really um, developed. Mm -hmm. Let's come to this point. Uh, the, maybe these two slides are, uh, are, um, are easier, right, to, to be understood for philosophers, but uh, let's, let's follow the, the um, rationale, right, uh, more or less uh, all together. The idea is that uh, we moved from simple causal paradigms uh, that were in need of implementation, and we came up uh, with uh, multi-causal frameworks. We shift from common simple dysfunction to multiple developmental pathways, reassembling constituent parts and we needed to combine environmental and genetic elements so that the models, if properly construed, and this is the, um, the challenge, right? How we can say that we are properly building and developing a model provides a middle ground between reduction and emergence. But without leaving, a, without being able to go beyond the inherited ontological epistemological reductionist paradigm, and we have been just able to complete the picture in this way, talking about complex causality, talking about the functioning walls, talking and going back to systemic assumptions without probably still being able to explain why all this is relevant for our understanding of cancer biology, of modeling cancer, for modeling cancer and for cancer research. So cancer biology, right? What is clear is that we are at the end of the day facing with the possibility of cells to move towards a, pheno a neoplastic phenotype or to go back to normality because reversion, tumor reversion is one, in my opinion, of most, the most interesting scenarios. We can uh, deeper and explore to understand better the overall uh, neoplastic process, especially in terms of origin of cancer, so carcinogenesis, in which all these factors uh, are actually involved. A concept that is uh, currently used uh, to explore uh, this uh, field is the, the notion of field of cancerization. I believe that you are probably all familiar with this concept, so I won't spend more time on this, but epigenetic factors and even physical mechanical factors are uh, involved. But this is relevant for modeling cancer and for the attempt for scientists in their scientific practice 
to find a, a level in which uh, the um, correlations, uh, the causal correlation are maximized. What uh, in literature is also caused, called, sorry, this uh, non-trivial determinism. So the, um, uh, the aim to maximize this non-trivial determinism, which, which has to do with uh, uh, this possibility to identify a mesosystem in which mm, the uh, systemic uh, mm, features that are relevant to understand the processes to test and to intervene on the neoplastic process uh, appear. Mm. We can go back uh, to this point in the discussion if, uh, in, of interest uh, of uh, somebody, but uh, what uh, we can say at the moment is that this kind of approach, a mesosystemic approach, uh, is uh, really moving in the scientific practice from a, a reductionist uh, viewpoint about the organismic development to a systemic one, but taking into account also how science works in practice, because we need to modelize processes and we need to intervene on them in and through molecules, but not in molecular terms, so in systemic terms. This is uh, the uh, kind of uh, pictures we are uh, used to in uh, literature, and uh, this has consequence for cancer research now. We said something about the biology, cancer biology, and now cancer research. The main transition is here, it, how we can find a middle way between the in vitro cultures and this kind of tests and the tests in vivo. Mm. I think, uh, and we, I cannot expand on this, but uh, the, the, we are uh, moving in the right uh, direction. For example, with the concept and the tools uh, like uh, the gene regulatory network uh, um, model, or the organ on chip uh, technologies. Mm. And uh, for uh, research, uh, uh, cancer research instead, uh, I just uh, wanted to share with you these uh, uh, slides. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask you to look uh, into the details of this slide because it is provocative somehow. And possibly uh, other professors like uh, Professor Sparth Ares and others can answer or can offer an answer already to this kind of uh, gap that is that seems not to be still covered, right? In, uh, um, in the field of cancer pharmacology, while, uh, for example, in other fields like hypertension and other um, diseases seems to be already at hand. There is uh, clearly, and I, I agree, that uh, we are not uh, still uh, um, dealing uh, and controlling the right macro variables uh, in cancer biology to be able to intervene properly, taking into account the time and the timing. And that's why I think that the fifth characteristic I was mentioning at the beginning is very much related with the cancer heterogeneity, both in genetic terms and in terms of cellular phenotypes. This is the challenge we are still, in, still dealing with. And I think that part of the solution will come up from this ability, this possibility, we have collect collectively in the scientific field to identify macro variables that are useful to intervene on the neoplastic process. My proposal was precisely this one, which is summarized in that book published already five, four or five years ago. ago. So uh, to look at the mode of regulation more than processes or molecules. And uh, my final, uh, um, slide because my time is now ended is that if we move toward this direction we will be able to bring toward a convergence care and cure in the field in the field of cancer research and the biology of cancer a final slide to say that i can see a, a progressive collective orientation, which is also an advancement somehow, a concerted change in epistemological assumption and research practices uh, throughout the scientific community that can uh, uh, offer us a, a multidimensional actionability, actionability mm, framework uh, and uh, in which uh, the relevance of the spatial temporal structures is fundamental. And uh, for philosophers, uh, this means uh, that in my opinion, we should uh, revise our understanding of what is fundamental 
in epistemic and also in metaphysical terms in this uh, when looking at the organism and its uh, development integrated development the challenge of considering the multiplicity of context and the different measure of success i think is also important for funding strategies but i believe that this will be part of the discussion we can have afterwards thank you very much Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marta. I, I will just uh, introduce now Luis Pazares. He's a medical oncologist at one of the main uh, hospitals here in Madrid called Hospital 12 de Octubre. He's also the head of the uh, lung cancer unit here at the Spanish National Cancer Center. So Luis, um, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Maria. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this forum of uh, discussion of science and uh, philosophy. And um, over the next uh, a few minutes, I, I will try to somehow give you at least my uh, uh, thoughts about, um, so how are we doing today with difficult tumors? And actually for that, I will touch mostly on uh, lung cancer, which is indeed a very uh, challenging tumor. And um, as you see here, um, uh, cancer incidence is continuing to, to grow. To, I mean, this year we are expecting to diagnose some uh, 18, 19, 20 millions of cancer worldwide. And of those, uh, actually more than 2 millions are going to be lung cancer. But uh, incidence is increasing, as I said. And uh, in some 20 years, we would expect to actually diagnose not 20, but 30 millions. And this is actually having a big impact in uh, our country, as you may expect. Every, every year, we are diagnosing some 280,000 uh, new cases of cancers in Spain. And uh, those are some 120,000 in women and some 160,000 in males. So you may remember 40, 60, a percent relation between those. If you look at the cancers which are more frequent, you see that colorectal is number one, then prostate and uh, breast, second and third, nearly equal, and then is lung cancer. Uh, between three of them, you're actually getting some, uh, uh, seven, I mean, more than 50% of the cancers, what, I mean, in, in our country. However, I mean, the uh, things are actually improving, uh, I would say, in terms of the results. I remember some uh, 30 years ago or 35 when I was a resident in medical oncology, uh, survivorship at five years was in the range of 30 to 35 percent. So the first thing we have to say is that things are getting better. This is not uh, that uh, we are discovering penicillin every year for cancer. Therefore, improvements are done little by little, affecting one disease one year, maybe some subset of, of uh, patients with a given cancer every year, but not overall. But look at uh, the overall uh, improvement is very clear. Today, we are expecting in this country, that would be very much the figures in Europe or in Western countries, that five-year survivorship in women with cancer is in the range of 62% and is exceeding 55% in the case of uh, men. However, things, uh, I would say, are not equal for every cancer. We have improved a lot. And uh, the main reasons for that is we have created multidisciplinary teams, which are very important. So today, uh, look, dealing with cancer is not that uh, ha what happened some 30 years ago, that you go to the, the clinic of a very well-known doctor. Today, that is not happening. It's more an orchestra, which is going to play the, the, the cancer treatment. It's not a, 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 a just a one actor here. The main uh, reasons for that had been that technology had improved a lot in terms of surgery, diagnosis, but also in terms of uh, uh, under uh, covering important things like uh, gene aberrations that are important in the uh, uh, 
uh, emergence of cancer and in the progression of cancer so that we have been able to really uh, 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 have some new drugs that actually also improving the, the results in our clinical practice. Indeed, uh, if you look at the, the, the different cancers, we have discovered the main aberrations affecting the genes uh, of the different cancer. And actually, uh, Marta have referred before that uh, in cancer, we are not able to translate uh, so easily as other disciplines such as cardiology, uh, the, the, the knowledge of the uh, um, uh, uh, pathophysiology or the pathogenesis of lung cancer into treatments, into results. Actually, that I think is very much related to complexity. For example, I'm going to give you very complex tumors such as lung cancer, because they do have a lot of molecular aberrations are actually typically more difficult to deal with as compared to you go to the left to uh, children tumors or uh, hematological malignancies such as lymphomas or leukemias. I mean, those are typically uh, uh, driven by uh, less genes, complexity biologically somehow lower, and therefore you may understand that from the treatment point of view is much easier to address. But anyway, we will touch on that. We know that behind every molecular aberration, we are creating, uh, uh, I mean, two tumor cells are having some molecular disturbance that actually affect uh, important properties of the cells. And actually, Marta also sh have shown us the, 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 the description of the hallmarks of cancer by um, Weimer and Hanamark. And I think we have to somehow try to reconciliate back and try to uh, 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 control those dysregulation important properties of cancer to get good results. For that, thank goodness, we have better ways to actually tackle cancer today. And this is because of technology had improved a lot and we are able to target a specific uh, 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 intracellular or, or even uh, in the membrane targets of the cancer cell more specifically as we did in the past we are having actually small molecules that are very nicely pharmacologically, they get very much into the cells. We are having some other macromolecules that are very good at very specific at targets of targeting extracellular uh, uh, molecules. And even uh, gene therapy is actually something that uh, we are thinking about today. The problem is that we have not been similarly successful in, the, uh, in all cancers. If you look at the cancer mortality in Spain, you realize that actually some 23,000 people are dying of lung, of lung cancer every year, which means if we are diagnosing some 28 to 29,000, I mean, I would say like 80% of those tumors are actually dying. Those patients are dying every year. If you sum up, actually, the mortality for colorectal, pancreas, and breast cancer is very much the same, putting all three together as compared to lung cancer. So this means that uh, we are not being able to improve uh, over time the results similarly in our patients. Here on the uh, right uh, bottom of the slide, you see uh, evolution over time from 1970 in the five years survivorship in uh, uh, breast cancer. And you see that we are, have really improved a lot over time. Today, uh, some 80 or even more percent of these patients are actually a, a cure of cancer. And particularly for those tumors that are localized at diagnosis, survivorship is exceeding 90%. You look at lung cancer, things are totally different. The first thing is that most of the patients are actually diagnosed in later stage, stage three or stage four, more than 70% of the patients. And actually very few patients are localized stage one or two. And if you look at the survivorship of five years for those patients that are actually diagnosed uh, uh, in later stage survival is not that good. And even those patients diagnosed in early stages, 
survivorship at five years is in the range of 50 to 60 percent, which is not great as compared to breast cancer. Indeed, I'm just uh, really like to uh, show you very often this slide, which is uh, a, a trial comparing four chemotherapy uh, regimes, four chemotherapy uh, cocktails that we were uh, comparing one to each other in early, in late 90s. We, uh, uh, that were uh, some new drugs taxanes and cytabine and so on. So we didn't know which of the best drugs was better. When the combos were, com were compared one to each other, we realized that all of them were very similar. But the worst thing is that median survival, so the time where half of the patients were uh, actually alive or dead was actually terrible, eight months. So that means the life expectancy 20 years ago for a patient diagnosed of lung cancer, stage four, which is some 60% of the cases was very low, eight months. Thank goodness things had improved and I was gonna try to give you some ideas of that over the next uh, 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 15 to 20 minutes. And for that, I just gonna like to illustrate that with what happened to me some five years ago when a patient of mine actually presented this is a 30 years old male, prior smoker, some 50 years back, which means had smoked some 20 cigarettes a day for 15 years. And he was diagnosed in Christmas 2015 of a stage four squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. And the patient actually, at the time of diagnosis, had spinal cord compression. That means uh, as you see here, that the tumor is actually getting into the vertebra, it's actually compressing the, 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 the medulla, right? So uh, the spine was really, really affected and he started to have compromise on the movement of the left uh, arm. So you see the tumor and that was destroying the, the, the bone, the rib, and particularly was destroying somehow the vertebra and getting into the channel, right? Okay, so then after receiving some radiation therapy, emergence uh, radiation therapy urgently because he was getting uh, some neurological, neurological symptoms, the patient came to us after Christmas for a second opinion. And I'm just gonna leave the case here. I'm just gonna give you some data and then we'll tell you how we have treated this patient. The main reason the patient came to us was because he had looked uh, in internet and realized that in some tumors, actually melanoma, there were some immunotherapeutics, some novel immunotherapeutics that were providing patients with this stage four disease, with metastatic disease, the probability of being alive uh, in the long term. This patient had had a children, uh, a child some two months before diagnosis, and he was not concerned about having a, 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 a median survival of eight months or 10 months or 12 months. He really liked to have some probability of being long-term survivor. And that was really his uh, 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 convenience. And he really liked to bet, let's say, anything of having a 2%, a 5% probability of being long-term survivorship. So this is something that we have taken into account because it's not only from the patient point of view, also from the society. Very often oncologists are actually uh, having big arguments with our, let's say, manager because we are spending a lot of money in the treatment of our patients. And typically arguments are that why you're spending so much money because you're only improving survival of your lung cancer patient two months or three months with this given therapy. And an important point of view here is not only the increase on median survival, it's actually the, uh, the, the expectancy of being, the probability of being long-term survivor, the probability of being cured, which is uh, really something that patients, particularly many patients, really appreciate a lot better. I'm just going to uh, give you some ideas uh, uh, through the following items. And I think today we have improved the treatment of many of our tumors because we know 
the oncogenes that are actually responsible for the initiation of that lung cancer and the very genes that are important for the progression of the disease. And today we are having some weapons that are allowing us to treat specifically those tumors. We have some more issues with tumor suppressors because those are not that easy to tackle pharmacologically. So this is a very good example. EGFR mutant lung cancer. Some 10% of the adenocarcinomas, maybe 15% in other places. Actually, those are close to 50% of the lung cancer in East Asia do have a mutation on this gene called EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptors. So if you put cells into the lab without the mutations, those in the left, and you put an inhibitor of EGFR, you're getting no activity. But if your cell is having the mutation actually after exposure to this inhibitor, the specific inhibitor of EGFR, you see that most of the cells actually enter into apoptosis. So this is an apoptosis, let's say, assay. So how do you look at apoptosis in your clinic? Well, it's very easy. So when uh, you're exposing a patient with a lung cancer with EGFR mutation, you give a, a specific EGFR uh, inhibitor, you're getting that. So those cells are actually dying off, are actually suicide themselves because of this massive apoptosis. And when you do an X-ray some two weeks, three weeks later, you see that the tumor is mostly disappeared. Then actually we have done the experiment, the, the let's say the more rigorous experiment where which is you're taking some patients, half of the patients are randomized to have a standard of care, let's say chemotherapy at that time, and half of the patients are actually given the novel therapy, the EFR TKI. And as you see that those patients given the specific inhibitor are actually living better and living longer. You see here the probability of being with the tumor uh, under control uh, uh, is actually maintained for longer time on the red uh, line with erlotinib, which is the specific inhibitor. The problem is actually, you see that most of the patients over time are actually progressing, which means are developing resistance. We were smart enough to those patients progressing to actually do a biopsy and analyze their genes. And what we found is actually the mechanism of resistance to the therapy in most of the cases. And actually in half of the cases, they get this mutation called the t 17 IDM mutation, which is actually uh, 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 distortionating the ATP pocket, the ATP uh, binding pocket, so that the specific inhibitor we were using before is not binding anymore to the ATP pocket. Nicely, some people were able to actually uh, 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 design uh, some other compounds that actually would bind specifically to the new configuration of the ATP pocket. For the one example is this drug called osimertinib. And as you see here, those uh, uh, novel drugs are actually much better they actually, if you look at this activity over time is much better and patients are living longer when are treated with osimertinib, the third generation drug as compared to the, uh, uh, um, um, let's say first generation drug. So those cell, because it's actually treating the uh, mechanisms of resistance, it's actually preventing this resistance to happen. Actually, I just put you an example of one portion of 10 to 15% of the lung cancers of the lung adenocarcinomas. So today we have some about eight to 10 subtypes of lung cancer with some specific uh, genetic abnormalities for which we do have a, a specific treatment. Here are some of the examples of uh, drugs that we have been developing over the last two or three years. And as you see, most of the patients are actually responding. You see how is the tumor decreasing in size after exposure to the drug. This is the example of lung cancer driven by uh, uh, red fusions or by uh, um, fusions in another gene and track, uh, as you see here. And indeed today, 
when we are diagnosing a patient with lung cancer, we are actually looking a number of mutations, as you see here in the, in the, in the upper part of the slide. And if those patients are having these mutations, we treat those tumors specifically with a given therapy. And this is about 25 to 30% of lung cancer. So that means we have a specific treatment for those tumors. And look what happened. This is a study in US where a thousand patients were actually genotype their tumors, their lung cancer tumors. So there were some patients that had a specific genomal abnormality and were treated with a specific therapy. This is the orange line. They were doing pretty well. Then there were patients that uh, had no drivers, no genomic abnormalities for which we have tumors. They were doing worse, light blue. And then there were those patients that actually had driver, the dark blue line, but no targeted therapy was given. Even they have a target gene, they were given a standard of care chemotherapy. And you see what happened. Those patients actually were not doing that well. So that means today, every time that a patient is diagnosed in our hospital, we do an array of uh, genomic uh, uh, investigations uh, so that we are classifying very well the tumor morphologically, but also we need to know the last name from their father, from their mother, and so on. We really know, we need to know the genomic background because this is going to help us to guide the treatment of those patients. That is so-called, what is so-called uh, personalized medicine. And I think lung cancer is one of the best examples today. Actually, sometimes we are having not tumor left after diagnosis, and we are not able to do this genomic study in those patients. And we do it in liquid biopsy. We are taking some blood from the patient. We are actually able to capture ctDNA, circulating tumor DNA, and then we do the analysis on this ctDNA. And we discover the genomic abnormalities that is helping us to uh, guide the treatment of those patients. Still, there are some difficult tumors, and I'm just gonna give you the idea. Among lung cancer, which is a difficult tumor, there are some difficult subsets. The more typical one is KRAS driven lung cancer. KRAS is a really difficult to tackle a, a, a genomic abnormality therapeutically. It's about 25 to 30 percent of the lung cancer, lung adenocarcinoma that do have this disease. Thank goodness we have discovered now a, a drug, a number of drugs which are actually able to bind to the GDP. Uh, uh, um, um, binded or, uh, uh, of uh, KRAS uh, uh, covalently. So it's trapping the, uh, the KRAS on the, G on the uh, GDP form and is not activating anymore. It's not cycling to the uh, uh, GDP uh, binded uh, uh, KRAS form. That is only happening in some 40% of the lung cancers with KRAS mutation because they do have this uh, G12C type of mutation, some other mutations, some other uh, uh, codons uh, ex, uh, uh, mutations are not actually uh, 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 responding to that uh, uh, tumor. And I'm just going to give you some examples here. This is one of the first drug that we have discovered, Sotorasib. You see that most of the patients are actually responding. The tumor is decreasing in size over time. And actually, 35% of the tumors actually is decreasing their size in more than 50%. And still, we got better drugs than that. So the very good news is that even for the more difficult tumors, such as KRAS, at least part of the KRAS, we are having some novel opportunities of treatment. Other important thing is actually looking at the commutations. We have said before that uh, lung cancer is not driven by a single gene. Typically, they accumulate uh, a big number of mutations, very high numbers of mutations. And actually, when you see uh, commutations, Actually, sometimes we are able to see which patients are going to respond to a given therapy. This is an experiment in some of our uh, mice where uh, those were tumors expressing uh, uh, 
a, 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 a receptor, which is fibroblast growth factor receptor, which is very often expressed in lung cancer. And they were responding to specific inhibitors depending on co-expression uh, uh, of uh, another relevant gene. In that case is uh, uh, N-caterine. You see that those tumors without co-expression of n cadherin they were not responding. This is what happened in our mice. On, uh, if they are having expression of those genes, uh, FGFR, but also n cadherin they are responding. And if they do have a lot of expression of FGFR1 and FGFR4 plus uh, expression of n cadherin they really respond very well to those specific inhibitors. So this just to give you an idea that we are not only looking at a single uh, gene today, we more and more often are actually uh, doing multi-parametric evaluation of what are uh, the reasons the tumor is responding or not over time. Okay, so uh, the last thing I'd like to say is that some of the tumors actually, uh, today we are not actually tackling the tumor, but the microenvironment. And this is again, going back to what Marta was saying about this revisionist view of the tumor, looking not only at the tumor cell, we now are actually not looking uh, at the tumor itself, but also to the landscape, to the microenvironment. And indeed, uh, some of the novel immunotherapeutics that are actually modulating the immune system actually fostering, making them more active. Uh, you see that you are getting some very significant results. Those are tumors with uh, treated with PDL1 inhibitors or PD1 inhibitors, which is PDL1, PD1 is a very inhibitory signal of the immune system, which is uh, actually uh, used by many lung cancer tumors to evade the immune system. By inhibiting this inhibitory sin, uh, signal, we are getting some significant results. Look at here, survival sheet at five years of patients with high expression of PDL1 is actually 32% with these specific inhibitors as compared to a 30% uh, with chemotherapy. We have in some other results with chemotherapy, uh, improving those uh, uh, results uh, with uh, immunotherapy as well. And I'm just gonna, uh, to finalize, I'm gonna give you what happened to our patient. This is our patient that came to us for a second opinion. That patient actually uh, was given the probability of getting into a phase one trial on a phase three trial with uh, some novel immunotherapeutics. He was really uh, uh, designed to get into a, a one of those experimental tumors, having the probability of being long-term uh, uh, survival. And as you see here, the patient had a very nice response with only two courses. Most of the tumor actually disappeared. And actually this is last uh, evaluation some six months ago, and it's actually coming to me next week and you see here that the tumor is actually mostly gone. You see here at the beginning, here is not anymore. Look at that, the rib is actually being reconstructed. Look at that, the, 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 the uh, vertebra is also being reconstructed. So uh, that means that uh, the patient that was a stage four disease metastatic over time is improving. And just to give you an idea, that were only uh, two kinds of immunotherapy that are working today. Thank goodness we are having a number of other uh, 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 immunotherapeutic targets that are evaluating in phase one trials and phase three trials, and we are hoping to get some better results for our patients in the near future. And I think that is very much summarizing with uh, what I like to say for today, providing some idea that our patients are actually not only concerned about having a bit better survival, not only about living a bit longer, but having the probability of being cured is something that our metastatic patients are looking forward to today. And this is a reality. We are able to provide our patients uh, the best care. Thank you very much. And I think that's all for me for the time being. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luis and Marta. I think it has been uh, you know, very interesting to hear both of you, one after the other. Uh, I made just uh, uh, start a discussion, but of course I think it's very important that the both of you discuss. But um, 
Uh, from um, Marta's talk, I, I, um, I um, would like to highlight the, the, the sentence by Albert Einstein, make things, make things as simple as possible, but not more. Um, I think, however, even though it's true that in, in uh, cancer, um, I mean, in the study of cancer cells on cancer treatment, the scientists have been reductionist uh, for, for the most part, I think since the war on cancer by Nixon, most of the time, the approach has been reductionist. Um, I think, um, as Luis has shown, that when this re reductionist view uh, goes to understand the origin of cancer, uh, not just uh, things that may be associated with cancer, but, but the origin of cancer from the molecular point of view. So, and we heard about oncogenes, we, we, we heard also uh, now more recently about immune therapy, etc. I think it's clear that there are advances. I mean, I, I, the slide that Luis put uh, with the combination of different chemotherapies that was extending lifespan but by only eight months, I would say that's without understanding cancer from the molecular point of view, because that's just treating with things that kill cells, and that doesn't work. But uh, as, as soon as scientists, and this took a lot of effort, started to understand from the molecular point of view, cancer is not that cancer has been solved, which it hasn't, and there are still many patients that die with lung cancer, etc. But at least we can see more incremental or more significant uh, advances in, in survival. So, so I would say that it's, it's not only um, going from a simple paradigm to maybe a more complex systemic paradigm, which I agree that is very important. And a proof of that is the immune therapy, for instance, or, or the understanding of the mi microenvironment. My, but maybe it's also the right question, right? Is, is to find the right uh, targets to really understand which is really the origin of, of a particular tumor type or, or and, uh, maybe a combination of both things. So this is my, my thoughts. I think uh, you should discuss maybe, Marta, if you want, want to start um, and then um, I think Luis and you should should really make this debate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. And I really enjoyed it, uh, listening to uh, the presentation of Professor uh, Paz Aret. Um, my simple answer to your uh, question, although it it was probably more a comment, right? <laughs> then, yeah, no, my, it's just a then, comment. A comment uh, yeah, exactly. But... Uh, I think that the problem from an epistemological point of view would be simply um, rephrased in terms of what we are actually understanding or should understand as a target. Because uh, uh, as you know, we can give names, proper names uh, to molecules. But as uh, I understand, uh, as far as I understood, uh, or some slides that uh, have been shown in the second presentation, we are in fact targeting not pieces of the DNA. We are not targeting pieces of matter, let's put it in this way, but we are targeting dynamics. So my question for, uh, um, uh, for uh, uh, Luisa, if I may to use it <laughs> this easier, it, it would be um, because I, I agree that we have uh, uh, many evidences uh, that uh, there is uh, um, a real improvement uh, in uh, targeting uh, because we can see in empirical terms uh, that something good is happening. But what about the question why it is so effective? Should we, could we expand or should, could we train our young scientists uh, in stopping and sitting down and studying and reflecting on the explanatory relevance of those empirical findings. Because I think that this is the gap, the epistemological, the, method, the scientific philosophical gap we should bridge. And that might allow both to make sense in a much world much more uh, important uh, and relevant way of your own uh, empirical findings because uh, you can have uh, a wider and uh, stronger rational for your research programs and 
not uh, <laughs> which is also more uh, more important uh, very important uh, at least from my mm-hmm. point of view to push our agendas forward in a unified way not necessarily in empirical and molecular and uh, experimental terms but in uh, in terms of the framework we are building and we can we can come up with but uh, i would be happy to listen to yeah so i think actually the this i mean it's very important that we are able to simplify complexity to a point that is helping us to understand that complexity and what is the initiation of this complexity and i think experimental models are really fantastic for that and helping us to understand that and it's the only way we are able to really tackle properly biology and and from that point of view let's say genetic models of cancer and we are having more tools over time is helping us a lot still and uh, it's important sometimes that uh, not to be too reductionist and then to escalate those biological uh, those fundamental findings to the complexity of the system and a good example is that i mean we have forgotten uh, microenvironment for years i'm just going to give you an uh, i'm telling you the truth you're asking me 10 years ago about immunology i could say you know your death you're doing cancer and uh, I remember the first, I mean, like some 12 years ago, uh, uh, Dr. Topelian presented on a small session at our annual meeting in Chicago, uh, one presentation, and I saw four responses in lung cancer patients that had been treated. That was really something really uh, unexpected to me. So I really went to the library, uh, to the bookshop, and I uh, got a new uh, book on fundamentals of uh, uh, immunology again, because really, we really like to, we need to understand that. And we had forgotten about that. So that is a, a, a very important point. And this is the other issue that we have to, for example, be able to get in our young people, particularly young doctors, to understand the molecular basis of medicine, not only of cancer, of medicine. So we are used to a very, we have to get one log or two logs deep into the biology of why things happening. If we really like to treat patients accordingly, let's say today you're still able to memorize if you're a doctor, you're having a mutation of EGFR, use this drug. You have a mutation of that, use this other. But you know, this is getting more and more complex because then there are commutations. And then over time, you have to actually look at the dynamics of the genomics of those tumors. So it's not going to be possible. You, you're not understanding what is going on. And I think uh, we have to get somehow a shift in the culture of our uh, doctors. My, my uh, let's say, trainees very often telling me, you know, I'm more a clinical guy. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not, you know, uh, this, is not, this is not about being a clinician uh, that likes patients. You like patients, you really have to be ready and you have to, to get a culture that you're really understanding what uh, is going on and how to better treat your patients. Hello. <laughs> Thank Hello. you both your talk that were very interesting, even though I'm not an expert. So I hope that my question is still uh, out of scope. I was thinking about uh, the, uh, and it is a question for both of you. Uh, I was thinking about the fact that uh, in biology, um, an uh, evil, let's say an eco, evil, divo perspective uh, is uh, more and more advocated. So the idea is that you cannot understand uh, evolution, ecology, and development, uh, uh, taking them uh, in a separate way. You cannot abstract uh, one from the other, right? I was thinking whether your perspective um, about, uh, let's say, cancer biology can go in the same uh, direction. Is somehow fitted to an eco evo uh, perspective. Luis? Yeah, so I mean, you're really, you're really tackling what is part of our life, particularly you are a treating physician. 
the issue here is that this Guardi uh, Darwinian evolution, uh, where the strongest are uh, surviving, is what happened with our tumors cells. So let's say you treat a you remember those curves where I treat a patient with a specific inhibitor of EGFR. Yeah. Only those tumors that are those cells that are actually getting a secondary mutation are persisting. And then you treat again with a second drug and only those tumors with a, that are able to biologically escape to that inhibition are persisting there. And actually from the very beginning, when we analyze tumors in depth, even when they are less than half, uh, half a centimeter, we are all, we're starting to see those evolution, evolutionary changes, not only in the tumor cells, but also in the immune landscape, on the microenvironment. So it's really happening very early on. And uh, uh, I mean, this is actually the reasons for tumors to get resistance because some of the cells are able to evolve and to actually uh, create uh, or get some uh, secondary mutations that are able to enable them to survive even under the pressure of some treatments. Yeah. Uh, Luis, uh, I try to, to answer Elena's uh, question asking you a question. Right. Would, would you accept, would you say that it is uh, fair enough, uh, okay, from an explanatory point of view, saying that those cells uh, that are uh, mutating uh, and that are developing resistance in a given microenvironment. That behavior can be explained not necessarily or not fundamentally from the perspective of the cell that is doing things or developing new active properties, but from the perspective of a permissive microenvironment. So that what is more relevant in explanatory terms is uh, the functional landscape uh, in the language of uh, the eco evo divo uh, also uh, framework right so in this this concept of landscape which is a dynamic concept uh, and uh, which is our uh, macroenvironmental uh, features uh, not only related with uh, for example the composition of uh, the ecm uh, like uh, beta catenin or tubulin as you show in one of your slides. I think that that slide is fantastic hmm, from this point of view, eh? but from because of the architecture of the macroenvironment. Yeah, so actually, that... I think those are very much related. Let's say you get in a tumor of lung cancer with a mutation of KRAS. Yeah. And then you have the same tumor with a mutation of EGFR. And then you look at the microscope and the, micros, the, the, the microenvironment is totally different depending on the mutation of the tumor. So that means tumor cells are actually having a big influence on uh, determining the landscape. But so those mutations the, are, are also related with the very process absolutely. of building of yeah. the microenvironment. Absolutely. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So my, my short answer to Elena, uh, sorry, Maria, I will stop talking afterwards. <laughs> My short answer uh, to Elena is that uh, um, empirical evidences, uh, in my opinion, are precisely moving towards that kind of a framework. Still, uh, the language, because of the experimental language, is very much <laughs> related to the inherited uh, what we call a reductionist, uh, <laughs> because we do need uh, to work through those experimental tools. My point is that the training and developing this kind of discussion, like the one we had with Luis right now, mm, trying to figure out uh, what are the conceptual mm, tools we are actually using to explain the process uh, and not simply to say what is actually happening here and now when you tackle a specific molecules, so explaining why that molecules and because of what process is actually effective, we can get to a very much more powerful understanding of the biology and precisely you mentioned the biology of cancer and not cancer research as such, mm -hmm. but yeah. So immun actually, immunotherapy is a very good example that we are not treating the tumor. We are treating the microenvironment, the immune cells. Sorry, Maria. 
No, no, no. I think it's a, it's a very good point. I think um, uh, immune therapy may be one of these um, reflecting on, on one of these upstream uh, empty boxes that you show, Marta, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, which is uh, really a failure of the immune system. And um, I mean, the cancer cells have overcome the immune system, and uh, this could be one of the of the reasons. Actually, I I I, I think the the um, um, the, 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 the most important risk factor to develop a cancer is aging of the organism. And this may include also um, immune senescence, et cetera, many other things that happen in our organism. And this is something that is very little studied. So I, I, I mentioned this because I'm interested in, in aging, but we don't have to forget that this is something that has not been explored very much in the cancer field and in many other diseases. So I think we, it's only one minute left. I don't know if either there is any other question or maybe we can, we can, we can stop here to, to keep with the, with the very busy agenda for the morning. And any, uh, Marta or Luis, you want to, to add anything just, else? Just one thing I'd like to say, these empty boxes you refer, Maria, as compared to cardiologists, we tend to say to our cardiologists in my hospital that they are cardiologists because they like simple words, simple words that are easy to tackle. <laughs> Complexity is a bit more difficult sometimes. And, uh, you know, that is the reason is keeping some of the boxes uh, empty and is giving us some uh, time to, to think and uh, try to, to get that solved. If you go to neurology, the boxes empty would be more and more, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. But but still, um, I think we have to learn something for, from cardiologists because uh, they have bio, <laughs> they have biomarkers that are able to to detect the risk of a of a person to develop then a cardiovascular event, and we don't have that for cancer. And I think that's something that we have to to learn from from them. My last word on this, Maria. Sorry, <laughs> this follow up on this and you in the Luis previous uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, intervention is uh, that we should understand much better what kind of complexity we are facing with and that this is a challenge both for philosophers and scientists but that's a yeah mm -hmm. okay uh, in any case I think it's obvious that it would be interesting to have more of these discussions of between philosophers <laughs> and, and some medical doctors because I think um, it's really very interesting. So thank you very much, Luis and Marta. And, and I think right now we have to take um, a break. Welcome again after uh, this uh, very interesting uh, first session, let's start uh, our second session. Uh, the topic of this second session is socio-environmental -en factors of health and disease. And our two speakers are Ana Stani and Mikel Porta. Ana Stani is a emeritus professor of, at the philosophy department of the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. He research is devoted to the cognitive approach in epistemology and philosophy of science and to design science. She is Master of Arts in Indiana University and PhD in Universidad de Barcelona. She has been in University of California, San Diego as visiting a scholar. And she has published a lot of papers and books uh, among the books, I, I will remark uh, Eureka, El Trasfondo de un Descubrimiento sobre el Cáncer y la Genética Molecular, with uh, David Casacuberta, or uh, uh, the, the last one uh, uh, with uh, Jordi Valverdú and, and Angel Puyol, uh, The Philosophical and Methodological Debate in Public Health, uh, published by Springer. Now she's working on medical and epidemiological reasoning and on design epistemology. Uh, so Anna, the floor is yours. 
Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, just to um, uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation and to be able to par participate to this interesting uh, meeting. Uh, just because we, we don't have a lot, I, I don't have a lot of time, just uh, I, I go on. Uh, the, um, the title, I think you already know, Design Epistemology as Innovation in Biomedical Research. Uh, Let's say uh, that the idea of design has reached our theories of epistemology, a field that at first glance seems to be quite far removed from the analysis of practical situations. Uh, epistemology, on the one hand, epistemology has shifted from an a priori perspective to a naturalized one. Naturalized one, the, the naturalized program in philosophy of science and epistemology, means that Empirical sciences are relevant for the models in epistemology and philosophy of science. On the other hand, philosophy of science has expanded its field of analysis to applied science. This is the reason it is relevant design epistemology as an alternative to the analytic philosophy, to analytic epistemology. So the objective is to explore how far uh, design epistemology can be adopted as a methodological framework for research in, in biomedical sciences and in some of their applications as public health. So, first of all, we will analyze different approaches to uh, design epistemology and related terms and expressions such design thinking, design theory, and designerly ways of knowing. Then we will consider where to place biomedical sciences within the field of academic knowledge and research. And we see that the disciplines involved in this field of research range from biology to medicine and also to the applications of this knowledge as in the case in public health. So we will see how uh, design epistemology can offer proposals and solutions to the challenges that a phenomenon as complex as, pub as public health currently faces. So this is my, my proposal, let's say, or my hypothesis that design epistemology can offer proposals to the solutions for public health. Let's say something about uh, design epistemology. The field of design epistemology, as we have said, is beyond the classical sense of a branch of philosophy, such epistemology, which seeks to illuminate the foundations of knowledge. Uh, design epistemology is presented as an alternative to classical epistemology, which is often described as analytical, not always, but the people who work in design epistemology consider that the classical epistemology is analytical versus synthetic, which will be the uh, design epistemology. So uh, design epistemology is said to have a, seri a series of def defining, uh, or a series of characteristics that we will see then if they are important for public health research. One is, I would say, interdisciplinarity as a means of addressing dynamic and complex problems. And on the other hand, a prominent element of social concern expressed through, the, through design thinking that revolves around human scale design. Let's say some authors uh, which have been saying something relevant for uh, design epistemology. Bengoa, for example, distintos acercamientos epistemológicos, cinco enfoques sobre los objetos, um, different epistemological approaches. The idea is that epistemology is concerned with the foundations and methods of scientific knowledge, the classical epistemology, do not fit with the adequate a variety of objects that inhabit our field of knowledge nowadays. And he makes a distinction between epistemology for design, a science of knowledge that assists the designer, for example, it, this will be the same as philosophy or epistemology of physics, of chemistry, of biology, of social sciences, and epistemology of design, in the sense of an epistemology to, to use as a tool uh, the epistemology to examine and learn about the reality of design itself. Maybe, I mean, for not philosophers, this can be uh, not very clear. Let's say, uh, let's put an, an, an example. For example, we can distinguish between philosophy and, or epistemology of cognitive sciences and cognitive approach 
to philosophy of science or uh, epistemology. In the first place, philosophy of cognitive science is just philosophy of physics or philosophy of biology. But cognitive approach to philosophy of science or epistemology and epistemology means that we accept that some um, um, cognitive models uh, can clarify some debates in, some, some debates in epistemology or clarify I don't, I, uh, I don't see, I don't know if to solve, but at least to clarify some debates in epistemology and in philosophy of science. And this will be the same in the case of epistemology. Mahuvi, in this paper 2003, Epistemology of Design, classifies design as activity, as planning, and as epistemology. As activity relates to the conceptualization stages of making new products, as planning is more closely related to the management of a wide range of fields from business to the military and from hospital to universities, and as, as epistemology relates to the synthetic methodology, methodology needed to understand potential, potential change in the world, in the phenomena. So the analytic methodology has been shown to have shortcomings, according to Mahuvi, <clears throat> which have allowed the synthetic methodology to flourish, taking the epistemology of design as an alternative that can alleviate such deficiency, especially in fields such as engineering and medicine. Another um, author, Harabek, in Design Epistemology, uh, also thinks that design is an alternative to tradition, and this requires questioning of traditional epistemology that then not fit with innovation as the central axis of scientific research. Finally, Osman, um, in Design Theory is a Philosophical Discipline, the reframing the epistemological issues in design theory, introduces the three ideas, design theory, design research, and design knowledge. Everything in this design epistemology. Finally, uh, about the, the authors uh, to introduce is Niels Cross in 2006, uh, in, in, with this book, Designary Ways of Knowing. He doesn't uh, approach especially design epistemology, but this is very important because he relates science and design. Uh, um, and, and this it makes another line uh, in our culture. Uh, he um, suggests that design constitutes the third culture in addition to the two cultures of science and humanities. Think of Snow, that uh, he was in, the, in, this, in his uh, paper, The Two Cultures, uh, um, explaining um, the two cultures, science and humanities. Cross says there are a third culture nowadays, which is um, um, design. And, the, and this means uh, um, some changes in education. For example, he thinks that design in general education is not primary, or it should not be primary a, prepa a preparation for a career, or nor is it primary a training in useful product or skills for doing and making in the industry. It must be defined in terms of the intrinsic values of education. So, uh, and in this relationship between science and design, expressed, <coughs> he <coughs> introduces three ideas. One, scientific design, design science and science of design, which is not the same, at least for cross. Scientific design will be uh, refers to modern and industrialized design based on scientific knowledge. Design science refers to an explicitly organized, rationally and wholly systematic approach to design. And science of design refers to that body of work which attempts to improve our understanding of design through scientific Method, method of investigation or research. Uh, so, cross studies these, uh, the stages of the, any design process, which uh, he formulates the formulation of the problem, the generation of the solution, and the strategy to be adopted in the process. Uh, you can see that for cross, the problem, uh, to define the problem is very import important for any kind of, of in, in process of innovation. So let's see now uh, design thinking. Design thinking uh, is central for uh, design epistemology, 
especially for synthetic epistemology, as we, ha we have seen, uh, that is an alternative to analytic epistemology. Just two authors, one is uh, Lockwood, defines design thinking as the process of innovation centered on the human factor that emphasizes observation, collaboration, and rapid learning. So the idea of design thinking is one way of approaching the innovation processes centered on solving human needs as best as possible. So it places design in the center, at the center of innovation. I think there, there are two words that nowadays are uh, central in our world, uh, are, and especially in our, in, our, in our academic world. One is innovation and the other one is design. So it places design, uh, design thinking in the center of innovation, an issue that is very important if we consider the cognitive abilities uh, of humans. And the other is Papanet in Design for the Real World. In, for him, design thinking focuses on social responsibility in production or, or has to focus on social responsibility in production. And he criticizes designers who only take into account consumers with a high economic potential. And it is, this is the reason why it is important to evaluate user satisfaction with any type of with, with any time of product, taking into consideration parameters such usability, accessibility, comprehension, and experience. These are not the, the main parameters for the analytic or classical um, epistemology, which is more, more um, mathematical model, simplicity, justification, and so on. This is. This is one more indicator of the degree of democratization of innovation. Let's go now to the public health research. Uh, public health is a complex and important field for any society. Uh, this is a fact. This complexity requires the intervention of many actors when dealing with it. And this research needs to incorporate, incorporate knowledge from different disciplines. This is the reason we and we have to reconsider the classical uh, or the classic methodological models of science. There are many definitions uh, of public health. Uh, I have just chosen um, uh, public health ethical issues, um, this publication, and the future of public health uh, by the Committee for the Study of the Future of Public Health. And I just I have chosen three definitions just as an example, there are many, many uh, definitions. Uh, one is the science, which is health, uh, public health, the science and the art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health through organized effort of society. As another definition, the mission of public health is to fulfill, to fulfill society's interest in assuring conditions in which people can be healthy and public health is the science of protecting and improving the health of communities through education, promotion of healthy lifestyles, and research for disease and injury prevention. All of these characteristics and many other, I think they, they share uh, these the, the characteristics, the impact uh, healthcare has on society, the aim of ensuring a good quality of life for the members of the society, the development of healthcare policies that promote medical services as a response to the needs of individuals and the prevention of diseases through social initiatives that range from education to prevention through diagnosis in populations, particularly at risk of specific diseases. So now it is, uh, we have seen design epistemology, we have public health research, uh, which can be the role of design epistemology for public health research. So, uh, research in this area, in public health, and the possible solutions to problems require the convergence of these factors, of different factors. Among others, we, I can say, a range of disciplines and contextual values. And this takes place within the context of the interrelation between theoretical and practical knowledge. We need both theoretical and practical knowledge. So, public health research encounter, I think, this is my hypothesis, in design epistemology proposals that address the challenges it faces. Which are these proposals? I cannot mm, explain very much of these proposals, but just uh, to point out 
on the one hand, the theoretical framework, on the one hand, on the, the theoretical framework, uh, which I think this framework, uh, for me, is very important, the, um, the Herbert Simon science of the artificial. Uh, so, uh, and um, the idea of design science, define a science that does not only describe the world, and not primarily, but rather it tends to change it, and the philosopher who uh, is part also of design of this framework, I would say uh, the Ilka Nini Lotto, 1993, uh, he writes a paper, The Eminent Statue of Applied Science, uses the Simon's idea as a reference for the philosophy of design science. So for the case at hand, there's to mean for public health research, there are several different design sciences that make up the field of public health, such as medicine and epidemiology principles, but it could be other. For example, the, the cancer research, I think, could be a, a design science in, in this sense. And also the methodology. We have, I have said before that we have to reconsider a methodology of models. Probably I cannot explain right now, but uh, uh, the classical uh, scheme of method methodology in pure science, it doesn't fit exactly with, uh, the design, with the methodology in design sciences. And there are some, for example, McClory, Mahol, that maybe probably I don't have time to explain, but uh, the idea is that, that we have descriptive sciences uh, or pure sciences and design sciences as medicine, engineering, science education and so on. And for these sciences, for th these design sciences, we need some uh, design methodology. Among this methodology, for example, this is McClory and if we have time later or maybe with the debate, we, I can explain more or less this scheme. Uh, design epistemology, uh, finally, uh, characteristic of design epistemology constitutes extremely important elements for public health research. Among many others, I uh, just point out wholeness in the sense of the integration of different elements within a specific phenomenon. Interdisciplinarity, I have already said this, which is vital for such a complex field as public health. Uh, Karabek um, refers to knowledge federation as a kind of interdisciplinarity. Uh, professionals of different natures intervene in public health, from doctors and nurses to healthcare educators, hospital administrators, social workers. Therefore, an epistemological model that takes the different professions into account may be extremely fruitful for the development of healthcare policies, and in this way, offer solutions to the challenges that are faced uh, in healthcare. Conclusions. Public health constitutes one of the most important challenges our society faces. Classic epistemology has focused on what has been called peer science, or descriptive sciences, as uh, Nini Lotto um, um, expresses. Nini Lotto prefers to uh, talk about descriptive sciences in, instead of pure science. Public health research is ground in both biomedical science and knowledge of the context in which society develops. This means that what is also needed in, in is the implication of, for example, sciences as sociology, demography, politics, and ethics. So we can conclude that applied science is crucial when it comes to be addressing to addressing and providing solutions for the problems that the field of public health faces. And thank you very much. <clears throat> I think it's uh, 20, 20 or 25 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, very interesting. As you know, I admire a lot of the Nini Lotto's work. So it's a very interesting topic for me. Well, our second speaker, is Miquel Porta. Uh, Miquel Porta is professor of preventive medicine and public health in the School of Medicine at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. He is an adjunct professor of epide epidemiology uh, in Gilling School of, of Global Public Health 
at the University of North Carolina and uh, adjunct professor uh, at the Grossman School of Medicine uh, at the New York University. Um, he works on molecular, uh, clinical and environmental epidemiology of cancer and has promoted uh, the integration of biological, clinical, environmental and social knowledge and methods in research and uh, teaching. Uh, the unit of uh, Dr. Porta uh, at uh, IMIM has uh, a distinguished record of internationally recognized research on the clinical and molecular epidemiology of pancreatic cancer, uh, with a focus uh, on the role of gene environment interaction, uh, including persistent organic pollutants other uh, endocrine uh, disruptor and other environmental uh, chemical agents. So, uh, Professor Porta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this invitation and for all of you attending uh, behind the screens. I hope I would be able to see your faces. Why should we bother? Why should we care about integrating uh, for instance, environmental knowledge. The first reason is that most of us, we accumulate during the lifetime complex mixtures of persistent toxic substances and many other environmental chemicals. The second reason is that there is a lot of knowledge, uh, toxicological knowledge on the alterations that these mixtures of chemicals cause in the human uh, beings, in the human body which is my main interest, human beings, integral, whole human beings, healthy or sick to some extent. So I think it is attractive uh, scientifically and relevant from a clinical and uh, social point of view that we try to integrate knowledge on the uh, toxic effects of these chemical cocktails when we build causal and mechanistic scenarios that aim at being relevant for human health. And finally, I think as a consequence that it is not uh, a good idea to forget about all these uh, knowledge that I have described uh, briefly in, in, in suggestions one and two. And I will develop this throughout my talk, okay? We'll get back to this. These are the percentages of detection of 19 compounds in, uh, in the Spaniards. So we find DDE, uh, the main metabolite of the pesticide DDT in virtually everybody. And we find many other polychlorinated biphenyls or other organochlorine compounds in virtually everybody, although the concentrations have been decreasing in recent years. It is very common that we are all exposed to these substances. Among the youngest people, at least about 6% in, in some populations have, we detect, three or more pops at quite high concentrations. And this percentage, for instance, I'm focusing on women, goes up to 20% and 47% and even 83%. So among women 60 to 74 years old, 83% have three or more persistent organic pollutants in the body, each of them. And 48% have six or more toxics at high concentrations. When we talk about aging, we need to consider this reality because these compounds are toxic. So, main ideas, part of the death and disabilities and diseases that we suffer in chronic and degenerative diseases as cancer and others are partly due to the interaction of these chemical contaminants during the body, during the lifetime. We have these contaminants in our bodies for two reasons. We are exposed to them daily, 
or our bodies do not excrete them and they are not eliminated and they accumulate. That's from the, the womb, from the maternal womb until death. These contaminants contribute to cause multiple genetic and epigenetic alterations. And I invite you, at, you know, during your research to consider this knowledge. The main way, the main pathway for the entry of many of these contaminants in our bodies are food and food packaging. The air, water, and many other uh, goods in our daily life. When we talk about causes of cancer, I, I, I suggest that you read this paper. It's a two-page paper by Miguel Hernan, okay? And if you want to go beyond that, you have to be aware that there is a uh, methodological revolution going on in clinical medicine and epidemiology, which is also relevant for many of the work you do in the lab. Uh, I just added two minutes ago these definitions of public health when I was hearing, listening to Anna. So you will have them uh, if you want to take a look at them at, at some point. Uh, very recent definitions of public health. Here, I want you to retain the idea essential that only primary prevention reduces the incidence of disease. Secondary prevention is early detection. It's not true prevention. This is a paper on which we provide a framework and many examples for primary prevention of cancer. We tend to forget that primary prevention is necessary and possible in the workplace, in the cities, because of what I just said, because of what we breathe, we drink, we eat, how we work. There are many examples of the co-benefits of interventions that aim at reducing uh, toxics in the environment. Co-benefits for cancer, for obesity, for metabolic disorders, for infertility, for other degenerative diseases, as Alzheimer's, for instance. And this is a quick overlook that you can look at later if you wish about the degrees of scientific evidence from public concern for a number of um, harmful exposures that are relevant for cancer. And this is an example of how climate change uh, policies against climate change and policies against cancer have co-benefits again. Because when we promote public transportation, we decrease air pollution in the cities and we fight against obesity, for instance. When we fight against tobacco, this has also environmental uh, benefits as well as benefits for the fight against cancer. And these are all examples of primary prevention. And this I was emphasizing in a slightly controversial paper about the causes of cancer. And the fact that from the research community and from the clinical community, sometimes we emphasize too much lifestyle and we forget life conditions. We blame the victims too much. We say, Cancer is your fault because you were not eating well, exercising enough, and so on. Please, let's try to avoid privatizing risk, saying the risk is only your problem, it is only you. Because many of the causes and solutions of harmful exposures, of carcinogenic exposures, have to do with the environmental and social processes the causes and the solutions. Um, I want to mention that just briefly, uh, Mario Bunge, which so many of you know well, because sometimes it takes just some courage as he had in this uh, response to, to Pampa Molina, some courage to look at knowledge 
that is relevant for our research and also has clinical and social relevance. Privatizing risks means that you are requested or required to take responsibility for environmental and social processes that are beyond your control. It means that you forget that when the fish has some PCBs, it is cheaper than when it has no PCBs. It means that instead of focusing both on individual and social factors, we tend to focus just on treatment or early diagnosis, not on primary prevention. So, of course, we have long stressed the importance of dialectic reasoning and actions and attitudes because individual behavior change is requested necessary as well as environmental change. But we can make it easier if we change the gradient, if we change the social conditions, the working conditions, the, the environmental conditions for individuals to behave in, uh, in a healthier way. Now, from a research perspective, remember that you have this uh, a stroke, which a uh, very important, uh, interesting re practical recommendations when you do research about, for instance, how to use biomarkers to study primary prevention and to study mechanisms, because this is a natural meeting place. The study of mechanisms of disease, the study of carcinogenic mechanisms, and the study of primary prevention. And this is the best example of how public and private policies decreased radically, lead used in gasoline and the average blood levels in the United States and throughout the world. So you didn't have to be looking around all day for your responsibility trying to avoid carcinogens, but the change in these energetic policies made it possible to decrease the body burden of lead to the extent that the percentage, percentage of children with uh, high levels of lead decreased dramatically in some 20 something years. And nowadays about only 6% of less of newborns have high levels of lead in the blood, okay? This is a magnificent example, and please get back to this when you think about primary prevention. I have published a number of papers in the lay press on these issues, and so please uh, take a look at them if you care about the ideological and cultural components of the the questions I am suggesting. When we talk about the integrative research, here you have some suggestions. Um, we all have some intuition about it, and this is a little bit uh, a link I'm trying to establish with the rest of the session. Please uh, read uh, later, because now I have to go fast. Of course, the idea of integration is not new for, for so many of you. I mean, you, in a way, this is what you're trying to do as Nuria in this paper, right? Uh, almost every day in your work. Here, what we see is that the risk of dying of cancer is much higher relative risks about one among people without formal education than among people who went to college in Barcelona. The risk is sometimes double for esophagus cancer, stomach cancer among men. Why? Because we also have to integrate environmental and social processes in the occurrence of cancer if we want, as Thenio wants, to stop cancer. Okay, here we see something that is provocative. Only cervical cancer mortality was higher among women without education than among women who went to college for many other 
diseases probably related to smoking or to having less children, the risk was higher among university women. So the sources and the pathways of exposure are economic, cultural, and social. And sometimes there are important ethical implications, obviously, as the number of children for uh, in breast cancer. This is one of the two main examples I want to sh I will be sharing uh, with you. This is a fantastic study based on over 20,000 pregnancies and specifically about 9,000 daughters whose mothers had blood drawn in the 60s and were followed for 54 years. Imagine storing the samples for 54 years and then decreasing these samples on the hypothesis that in utero exposure could be a risk factor for breast cancer, as indeed it was. We'll see this in a minute. Please take a look at this type of population studies conducted in real human beings living under real conditions when you consider mechanisms of cancer occurrence, and more even so, if you care about primary prevention. And you will see that they get quite sophisticated about ages of exposure, susceptibility windows, and so on. What was the main message of this paper? The main finding, the message was that breast cancer was three times more frequent among women in the mid 50s, whose mothers had higher concentrations of the pesticide DDT when they were pregnant with a woman who 50 years later, with a girl with a fetus, with a woman who 50 years later had breast cancer. Wow, wow. And to think a little bit about the psychological and cultural implications of this type of findings, I write sometimes papers as the one you see here, okay? Because we also want to integrate culture, right? As we, we've been uh, invited to do throughout the morning. This is another example of very creative uh, ways to study, not just one compound at a time, but to study pathways, uh, in this instance, uh, estrogenic pathways for breast cancer from the group of Nicolas Olea, where they also find that the risk doubles or triples depending on your uh, genoestrogen burden. This is just a reminder that there are plenty of top level scientific sources if you care, for instance, about endocrine disruptors, to which, I repeat, we are all exposed on a daily basis, which is a main reason, in my view, not just for an epidemiologist or a clinician or a toxicologist, the main scientific reason to try to integrate in your research this type of exposures, many of which are carcinogenic in addition to having other effects as the phthalates, which we find in everybody because our urines, the urines of all of us contain these plasticizers. Uh, we have measured that and we find them constantly. There are very important papers on metabolic disruptors. If you care about uh, overweight and the influence of these um, also obesogenic substances. And this is the other uh, top paper that I would really invite you. If you want to know, you know, what did he have in mind when he talked about integrating data from human beings and then, you know, um, developing laboratory work to test mechanisms for the observations. Of course, something we do constantly in medicine, right, is the dialogue, the conversation between um, observation 
an explanation, right? So this is a fantastic paper in this respect in which they integrate in vitro studies, uh, mouse studies and, and observations in human beings on the question of these parabens um, to which we are also exposed on a daily basis in food and in cosmetics. Um, so many, during many years of collaboration with Paco and Nuria and many others, we have uh, tried very humbly and modestly to test the idea that persistent organic pollutants and many other chemicals, they may help explain observations between some disorders and cancer risk. In the case of pancreatic cancer, because many toxics, many chemicals in our bodies contribute to cause diabetes, obesity, other metabolic problems and inflammatory problems, like for instance, chronic pancreatitis and, and periodontal diseases and others, because inflammation is the result of the exposure of the human body, of individuals, of persons, of human beings, because inflammation is one of the results of our daily and lifetime exposure to many of these toxicants, we are not surprised to see that diabetes is a risk factor of pancreatic cancer in addition to being sometimes an early signal or that obesity is related to pancreatic cancer because the underlying causes are exposure to the toxic chemicals I am uh, mentioning, okay? Like pesticides and so on and so forth. Uh, we also see that many of these compounds contribute to cause diabetes. In addition to diabetes prevalence increasing with weight, we also see it increasing with polychlorinated bifenyls. Even among people with normal weight, diabetes increases as your uh, these uh, organochlorine compounds, which we find in everybody, increase. So. Remember the first and the second reasons I was suggesting to, to take into consideration these, these problems. Okay? And this is an old, um, an old editorial I published uh, some years ago. In our uh, research, we have shown in modest ways, of course, that these contaminants, these persistent contaminants contribute to cause unhealthy metabolic phenotypes, even among normal weight people. These are the first two reasons, and this is a consequence of the two reasons why I am suggesting that you try to integrate uh, these uh, bodies of knowledge. And very often we have reminded researchers that when we want to detect cancer early, we have to keep in mind clinical knowledge, for instance, on the semiology, because sometimes, for instance, pancreatic cancer, the onset, the presentation is through the cholestatic syndrome. So jaundice and, and all that is important as well. Here um, we see, you know, how sometimes there are economic incentives for the fragmentation of knowledge because um, many companies work on the models of informatics and they think they will make more money if they fragment, fragment knowledge. And this is a recent uh, paper commentary on the reasons why we need more collaboration between biomedical research and environmental research, including the fact that sometimes in epidemiology, in, in environmental health, we should provide evidence that is more clinically useful. For instance, how these environmental exposures to chemicals influence adversely, negatively, the clinical course of the diseases. This is the paper um, on methodological issues we are addressing uh, now based on, a, on the EPIC study, which has been following for over 25 years 
over half a million people. And now we study the incident cases of the disease of pancreatic and many other cancers long after we took blood, they took blood, so the disease is not influencing the contaminants that we measure in the blood because this, again, this blood was frozen some 25 years ago. And this is how we conduct prospective case control studies. And uh, I am optimistic that you will soon see an interesting paper, which I cannot mention today. There are important consequences of this prospective design. For instance, the distribution of uh, total lipids of cholesterol and triglycerides is very similar among controls and cases of pancreatic cancer because this blood was taken many years before the cancer developed, thanks to the patients and the logistics uh, for such a long follow-up of half a million cohorts. And of course, you know that there are many mechanisms through which these, ex these exposures can influence different types of cancer. And I'm not gonna get into that, but this is a little bit the invitation. Okay, if you care about this type of mechanisms, then remember that these are dioxins, other PCBs, DDT, compounds that I was mentioning in one of my earlier um, slides showing that we detect them in almost everybody. Um, we have suggested, you know, some scenarios to try to unify uh, nutrition knowledge and knowledge on chemicals and hypomethylation of DNA, for instance, that you could easily criticize. There are other people who have made uh, proposed ideas about mechanisms, including, you know, non-genotoxic non mechanisms in cancer. So um, I was mentioning earlier, and I'm gonna finish uh, right away. I was mentioning earlier the courage that I think uh, Bunge, Mario Bunge had in responding to that question. And I think it takes some courage as well to consider my last suggestion, which is that in addition to integrating different types of knowledge and so on, we have to try to uh, avoid contributing to genetization of our societies. Um, the process by which issues considered to be medical or even social traditionally, but not necessarily genetic, become defined as problems with a strong genetic component or even as having only genetic causes. Attributing physiological, pathological behavior or social conditions to genetic causes. We have we have an obligation if we care about human beings about avoiding the unjustified, the scientifically unjustified expansion of genetics into the life and health professions. And we have to avoid the common mistake of, of considering that genetic is a synonymous of inherited, because then we neglect knowledge on acquired genetic alterations and on cultural inheritance. Um, if you care more about some of these issues, I invite you to take a look at our papers, of course, and our website, even uh, we have a presence on the social networks. And thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to any comments and criticisms that you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Porta. Uh, we have now the time for some question or some comments. Uh, if uh, any anybody want I... to make, to ask a question, can intervene <coughs> directly con connecting the microphone. Antonio, I have a question from Maria Gonzalez. 
Okay, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. I'm going to to try to to translate. As controversies are said to be indispensable for scientific progress, I wanted to ask you, don't you think that scientists have a self image of their own activities and result far from that of society in general and far from the philosophy? philosophical image of the processes of propagation of scientific knowledge. And don't you think that this make it difficult for society to understand the depth and therefore the importance of applying scientific results? Thank you. <laughs> you both can answer the, the question. Anna. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, if scientists are, um, I mean, uh, I think uh, the most questions in philosophy, uh, I don't think scientists uh, uh, look for philosophical questions. But maybe in, in their work, uh, in fact, uh, they are they take into consideration many questions that philosophers are just theorizing. So uh, probably, um, at least in, in practical philosophy, which I mean in philosophy, philosophy of science are, are interested, uh, probably, uh, I don't know, you, what, uh, this idea of interdisciplinarity to cope up with uh, uh, complex problems, I think the most part of scientists, at least uh, people in medicine, epidemiology, and so on, they take into consideration. Maybe why they don't uh, have this uh, theoretical, philosophical um, um, framework uh, that, for example, I introduced, like the idea of design epistemology. I think man, many of the questions uh, or many of the proposals of design epistemology, I think in practice, uh, scientists took into, into consideration, but maybe they are not institutionalized. In, institutionalized. Mm -hmm. uh, Miguel? Yes, um, I think it's a very important question. We need, we need to promote self-criticism about our own views and attitudes. For instance, when we talk, as I was doing, about blaming the victims or putting so much emphasis on, on diagnosis and treatment that we forget prevention. Or when we, when we think of research on cancer as almost exclusively channeled towards clinical care. And I have argued very many times that we need to do clinically relevant research, of course, but this is, uh, to me, important in itself, what I'm saying, and also a test to how much individuals and institutions, as Tenio, for instance, promote this reflection, the role of industry, the role of medicalization, you know, avoiding too much medicalization or genetization, how we promote a tranquil, a serene, a calm reflection and action on these, on these questions. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there is another question. Okay. Go ahead, Elena. Yeah. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the talk. Uh, they were extremely interesting and they, they gave me a lot of ideas. So I have to work on that. Uh, so I have two questions, one for um, Professor Anna about uh, design epistemology that I, it is a field that I didn't know actually, but I think it's uh, uh, an, a very interesting field also for um, the so-called uh, environmental crisis uh, and uh, um, conservation biology, et cetera, et cetera. And my question uh, was, uh, which is, I mean, in a way, uh, design epistemology um, is, a, let's say, an alternative uh, approach compared to traditional epistemology, right? So uh, my question is, uh, with how are pure sciences addressed by um, design epistemology? 
in the sense that it seems to me that uh, um, in design epistemology, you address uh, both of them, so applied sciences and the pure sciences. So, so that pure sciences are a part of what is addressed by uh, design epistemology. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think, um, let's see, uh, the pure science, uh, I mean, design epistemology, in fact, are more uh, interested or in applied sciences. So in, in the sense that uh, they think that the classical uh, method, hypothesis, justify, and so like that, is not enough for, for sciences as science education, science information, uh, engineering, uh, medicine, epidemiology, and so like that. All, all these, um, all these uh, sciences. So in this sense, they don't say almost anything about peer science. Uh, this, um, but this does not mean that for apply design sciences uh, or design epistemology, let's say design epistemology, are not important, uh, as it's not important the peer science or the knowledge coming from physics, from chemistry and so like that. Uh, but the, the, um, even the, uh, the criteria uh, to approach pure science uh, in the sense that the theories of physics, of chemistry, of social sciences are not the same as applied sciences, which are more practical. So in this sense, I think uh, um, the idea of uh, the, uh, design epistemology uh, wants just to have some influence also in pure science, in the sense that the, the, the pure science also uh, wants to, um, uh, to solve uh, human problems. The problem, I think, uh, according to me, I think uh, is different. Uh, design science, uh, pure science or descriptive science are applied science. But in the practice, they converge uh, both. But I think it's not the same science uh, as technology. I, I, I don't agree in the way that everything is techno science. We can uh, distinguish between uh, the, the, theoretical science and practical science, but in, in practice they converge. But conceptually, I think they are different. It's very important, for example, uh, this is a big discussion in philosophy of science. It's not the same, the characteristic of uranium and plutonium that the, um, um, uh, the atom bomb, yeah, let's say. So if you don't distinguish um, conceptually, then everything is the same. Uh, so I mean, it's, it's important in this sense. So the same for pure science and design science. I think uh, pure science, one, uh, for example, uh, molecular biology. I think they are interested especially in the process of the, the, the um, the, the molecules, but also, for example, uh, research in cancer research uh, uh, converts biological or genetic biology, but also the, what uh, the social context and social causes who in, uh, are important or are, have an impact in uh, the, ca the cancer. As I think. Uh, the, the talk um, by Miquel Porta is what he has been, has been saying. I mean, uh, so it's, well, I don't know if I, I have... Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, and uh, I completely agree. But yeah. maybe you have another question for Miquel, and then if you, if you want, we go on with this debate. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, my, my question for Miquel was, uh, I'm very interested in what you said uh, uh, at the end of your talk about uh, uh, cultural inheritance uh, and uh, I don't know behavioral inheritance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, um, but I, I would like to have your thought about uh, the fact that uh, when you think about uh, um, genetic inheritance, uh, normally the mutations that that, that are inherited uh, they favor fitness, right? They really? favor fitness. They improve uh, fitness. Uh, genetic mutations. Right. Well, many mutations are harmful in, in inherited mutations are harmful in cancer. Y yes, I'm not saying right. that uh, um, um, there are no, uh, let's say, negative mutations, 
But uh, it seems to me that in that respect, uh, there is a sort of difference between, for instance, uh, ecological inheritance uh, and uh, uh, genetic inheritance. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. But uh, uh, for instance, uh, if you think about uh, the case of uh, um, uh, pollutants, the, the fact is that we are transmitting somehow, um, let's say, an environment which uh, um, decreases fitness instead of uh, improving it, right? So it might be called maybe using the, the theory of uh, Laland and Odlin's knee, et cetera, et cetera, a sort of uh, negative uh, niche construction phenomenon. So the fact is that we are transmitting, uh, let's say, yeah, fitness decreasing environments. But and I wanted just to, to know your opinion about that. My, I would be delighted to study more uh, what the authors you mentioned, the ideas you mentioned. My purpose was very simple. In, uh, our, in the place where I live, in this institute where I am, in Cenio, in many research, ca cancer research institutes worldwide, I have the feeling that very often we only think about culture and, for instance, cultural inheritance when we leave work. There is a dichotomy. There is a schizophrenia. Culture doesn't belong you're not supposed to think about cultural in inheritance in your work. Whereas for, uh, you know, considering Italian cooking or Spanish cuisine, we all know what cultural inheritance is, right? Because it's the way we learn to eat in the families. And the climate crisis is outside work reminding us that we are inheriting, you know, this planet and that we're leaving it polluted for our children and so on. So it's not that we don't know about cultural inheritance, it's that we don't integrate it in our work. That was my only purpose, right? To think about that because the messages we convey to society about the human implications, clinical or social, of our research, forget about that, and we tend to exaggerate the clinical and social implications, the human implications of our research. And these I find dangerous. And by the way, I forgot to mention, but now it's uh, relevant as well, that we have explored a little bit the views of scientists and society, uh, the discrepancies in a paper we published with Carolina Llorente in PLOS One last year. Okay, uh, I'm afraid that uh, our time is over. Um, we, we, we will not have uh, the break after this session. So uh, I think uh, we will uh, start with the next session immediately. Let's start with the last session on uh, evolution, environment, and biodiversity. And uh, we have two speakers, uh, Elena Caseta from the University of Turin and Fernando Valladares from the National Museum of Natural Sciences in, in Madrid. Um, you, you can see in the, in the program of the event, um, the a sketch, a bio sketch of each of the, the, of the speakers. So I will not uh, present them in, in length. And I will just um, ask uh, Elena to start uh, her presentation now, please. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about uh, biodiversity healing, uh, that is biodiversity and uh, biodiversity conservation. Uh, and I have to... Okay, I hope it is like this. Okay, so biodiversity before biodiversity, uh, that means that uh, um, the term biodiversity is quite recent. On the contrary, the, uh, uh, on the contrary biodiversity has been a topic for uh, Western philosophy since its very beginning. Aristotle um, described and classified 
like uh, uh, 500 species in uh, his uh, biological writings. Uh, and he, and uh, he provided us with uh, uh, the basic structure of our classifications um, with the distinction between a species and genus. And then biodiversity, of course, uh, is what modern taxonomy aims at describing and uh, classifying. And biodiversity is also what uh, the theory of, of uh, evolution uh, want to explain uh, how it happened that uh, from uh, um, something, from a common origin, uh, there are so many species on earth today. Um, and, uh, sorry, because I have to move the, the pictures, okay. Um, and biodiversity is also at the center of uh, a more recent science, which is ecology. And in particular, uh, in the 50s, when this uh, hypothesis has been put forward, uh, which is called the diversity stability hypothesis. And the idea is that uh, species diversity enhances the stability of uh, species community. So the more a community is um, diverse in species, the more it can face, uh, for instance, uh, invasions or uh, um, disruptions of uh, uh, some kind. And uh, um, this is, uh, let's say, that the, st the stability diversity hypothesis uh, is also at the, at the center of the starting of the environmental movement in the United States. Uh, this is, let's say, the manifesto, Silent Spring, by Rachel Carson, uh, who was speaking about, uh, who was uh, denouncing the, um, uh, the, the risk for uh, not only both for nature and the human health, about uh, the uncontrolled use of pesticides, in particular DDT, as uh, uh, Professor Michel has uh, shown uh, before. Um, but then, as I was saying, the term uh, biodiversity is uh, uh, a lot more recent, okay? And it has been coined uh, in uh, specific circumstances. It has been uh, coined in 1985 by Walter Rosen, who contracted the expression biological diversity in biodiversity. And he did so during the uh, organization of a very important conference, which was the National Forum on Biodiversity that took place in Washington DC in 1986. It was a huge conference, like uh, 14,000 people attended. It was patronaged by the National Academy of Science, uh, the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, and among the invited speakers, there were very rock star, like uh, E.O. Wilson, Ernst Meyer, and uh, George Evelyn Hutchinson. And uh, uh, the main intent of the conference, uh, of the organizers of the, concept, of the conference uh, was uh, uh, let's say a political intent in the sense that the conference was meant as a cry of alarm for the anthropogenic loss of species, for the fact that uh, we are experiencing a uh, loss of species at an unprecedented rate. And uh, in 1985, so at the very same time, the Society for Conservation Biology was funded in the United States. And then in 1992, the Convention on Biological Diversity was signed in Rio de Janeiro, uh, which is the, uh, co the Convention on Biological Diversity is uh, the uh, most important uh, tre um, uh, treaty at a uh, global level for uh, conserving biological diversity. Now, um, this act of, uh, uh, let's say, coining uh, a new word, uh, biodiversity, uh, according to some authors, uh, and uh, I agree with them, was something more than a simple contraction, a simple grammatical contraction, in the sense that uh, the concept that came out, uh, so to speak, from the Washington Conference, uh, and uh, in particular from the Convention on Biological Diversity, was uh, a slightly different concept compared to, uh, let's say, biological diversity pre uh, pre, sorry, pre-biodiversity, okay, in uh, several respects. One is that it, it, it is a wider concept, uh, as you can see in the definition coming from the Convention 
on biological uh, um, diversity, where biodiversity is defined as the variability among living organisms, uh, and this includes diversity within species, between species and of ecosystems. Uh, so it is uh, taken into, uh, the, the, the three levels are taken into account, uh, genetic, genes, species, and ecosystems. While on the contrary, ecological research before biodiversity or so the diversity stability debate was more focused on species diversity. And the second point, and here I'm making reference to a um, nice paper by a uh, French ecologist uh, who is uh, Patrick Blandin. Um, according to him, a new research program started with, uh, uh, with the new concept of biodiversity because uh, uh, while uh, the diversity uh, stability hypothesis uh, was focused on, uh, species, on the relation between species diversity and the stability of the communities, uh, after biodiversity, uh, the relation to be studied were, uh, was more the relation between biodiversity and the functioning of uh, ecosystems. Okay, so the point is uh, whether ecosystems um, the, the, whether, uh, the, um, let's say, biodiversity ensure, uh, ensures somehow the fact that ecosystem functions and continue to provide their services to us. And third, the new concept include a normative component. Okay, and here I'm making reference mainly to the work of Saotra Sarkar, who is a philosopher of science. Uh, and he spoke about a, a sociologically synergistic interaction between the use of biodiversity and the growth of uh, conservation biology as a discipline. So the fact is that, uh, uh, let's say, a normative component of the biodiversity concept is rooted in, these, uh, in the fact that it is mainly used in conservation biology. Okay, so, but what is conservation biology? Uh, and here I make a reference uh, to the Manifesto of Conservation Biology, which is a paper written by Michael Soleil in 1985. And he wrote, uh, conservation biology, sorry, uh, word missing, is often a crisis discipline. Its relation to biology, particularly ecology, is analogous to that of surgery to physiology and war to political science. In crisis discipline, one must act before knowing all the facts. Okay. And ethical norms are a genuine part of conservation biology, as they are in all mission or crisis oriented discipline. So we need to act without knowing all the facts because otherwise it could be too late. Okay. And of course, values are included because we want to conserve biodiversity because it has a value, uh, be it an intrinsic value or an instrumental one. And uh, uh, he compared conservation biology to cancer biology because uh, uh, of their uh, characters of being uh, synthetic and multidisciplinary disciplines that involve both, uh, um, let's say, pure sciences, applied sciences, and uh, humanities. Okay. Now, how uh, conservation biology work? Here I am uh, uh, really oversimplifying but uh, this is more or less uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the procedure, so to speak. So at first, uh, the damage has to be assessed, okay? That means measuring biodiversity. We know that uh, uh, biodiversity cannot be measured, uh, not per se, because it includes too many, um, too many levels, okay? So it cannot be measured by one, just by, just by one measure. Then uh, we have to do the triage, and it is called triage also in conservation biology. Uh, that we have to prioritize because uh, usually resources are not enough. Okay, and then the patient has to be treated. That means that uh, the appropriate uh, um, conservation actions and procedures have to be uh, put in place, and finally the results have to be monitored. Okay. Now, in the second part of my talk, I will focus on just one specific point, which is treating the patient. And my question is, who is the patient, okay? And uh, I will propose uh, um, to distinguish between uh, uh, ultimate patient, proximate patients, and indirect patients. Okay. 
if we ask uh, who is the patient uh, for conservation biology, of course, uh, the, the prima facie answer is biodiversity, okay? But biodiversity is too wide and unmeasurable, okay? For instance, we can measure species diversity by means of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the Simpson index, but uh, there's no one unique uh, index for biodiversity as a whole, okay? So we can say that biodiversity is the ultimate patient, okay? But the, uh, the proximate um, patients are the targets of uh, conservation actions, okay? And in that sense, uh, here I'm just giving an example because of course, uh, uh, the, the, let's say that frameworks for conservation are different and uh, uh, targets can be different and so on and so forth. Uh, here I'm making reference to uh, the article that I already mentioned by Sarkar, who distinguishes between um, a meliorative approach and a preventive approach. Okay, the first one aims at uh, repairing problem after they have arisen. For instance, uh, when we try to save a species that have been brought to the brink of extinction. Okay, and uh, here, uh, Normally, conservation uh, biology has, uh, uh, let's say, rules for prioritizing species uh, plus uh, in situ uh, and uh, or or ex situ conservation programs. And another approach is a preventive one, which aims at preventing problems before the the arising, and uh, for and consists, uh, for instance, in managing healthy landscape before that there are indicators of their decline. Uh, and in that case, uh, the prioritization, prioritization will uh, focus on places uh, for biodiversity value, plus uh, procedure, and then there will be procedure in terms of survival of the biological units of interest. So in, in this case, we could say that the proximate patients are species and places. Okay. And then uh, the question that I would like to address, even though it is not my um, primary, uh, let's say, expertise, is whether Homo sapiens is a conservation is a patient for conservation biology. And the prima facie answer again here is no. Uh, clearly, Homo sapiens is not on the verge of extinction. But then, if you think about uh, um, cultural diversity, for instance. Uh, biodiversity conservation uh, in, is including more and more cultural diversity as well. Uh, for instance, in the 2010 Declaration on Biocultural Diversity by the Convention on Biological Diversity and UNESCO. So in this sense, we can say that at least uh, some uh, human beings uh, are approximate patients. But uh, um, maybe they also are uh, let's say indirect patients, and to um, to answer to uh, that question, we need to see whether healing biodiversity also mean healing human beings. And uh, um, here I'm making reference to an old uh, definition of a human health. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, defined the human health uh, as a state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not uh, merely the absence uh, of, of uh, disease or infirmity. Now, we know that uh, nature, uh, nature has, a bene uh, has benef beneficial effects on uh, health, but here we're speaking about biodiversity, and, uh, um, which is not nature, okay? Now, uh, there has been a study that uh, showed the uh, uh, psychological benefits of contact with uh, nature increases with uh, species richness and habitat diversity. So being in, uh, let's say, a rich uh, habitat has, uh, psychological has more psychological benefits than uh, in, uh, for instance, a uh, uh, monoculture land. Uh, uh, another study showed that when people watch aquariums with different levels of diversity of fish for 10 minutes, the more species rich aquariums led to greater decreases in people health rates, as well as to bigger improvements in their self reported modes. And of course, uh, there is a more general uh, uh, discourse to be made there. Uh, 
there are some, uh, um, some evidences that biodiversity decline may be contributing to the increasing prevalence of allergies, asthma, and other chronic inflammatory diseases. Here, the, uh, let's say the hypothesis behind, be, behind this uh, uh, claim is that uh, um, the macro diversity loss uh, can uh, uh, produce, uh, pr produces, sorry, um, uh, a loss on micro diversity and then uh, uh, decreasing in human exposure to microbial diversity that in turn can affect the human microbiota and then uh, um, let's say, produce a, a wide variety of uh, uh, inflammatory-based illnesses. And biodiversity may, an, uh, another hypothesis is that biodiversity may affect the emergence and transmission of infectious diseases. Um, the idea is that uh, the, a greater, uh, no, sorry, this is, this is a study about malar malaria, <laughs> And the hypothesis is that a greater abundance and diversity of warm blooded mammals might decrease the likelihood of malaria outbreaks in tropical forests. So in general, we can say that uh, natural biodiversity has uh, uh, somehow an impact on, uh, um, that, let's say that produces psychological benefits, uh, physiological benefits, uh, and it has an impact on uh, um, non some non-infection diseases, uh, on, infect on some infectious disease diseases, and it provides uh, aesthetic, cultural, uh, recreational benefits, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, tangible benefits uh, such as, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the main ecosystem services, uh, water, uh, food, uh, and uh, medicine. So I will, I, uh, this is my last uh, slide and I will just uh, uh, leave you with uh, two thoughts that I think will be better addressed by, um, by the next uh, talk. Uh, uh, two, two points that can be seen as a two, let's say, conservation dilemmas. The first one is whether Homo sapiens is a part of, uh, let's say, nature biodiversity. Because of course, from a biological point of view, human beings are just one species among the, among the others, right? But on the other hand, we tend to consider human, uh, the, the result of human activities as uh, artificial things, right? Uh, so um, are, is uh, Homo sapiens and especially it's, uh, um, let's say, and especially their products uh, a part of uh, biodiversity. Think about uh, um, genetically modified organisms or um, hybrid ecosystems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the second uh, question is, uh, can Homo sapiens be at the same time uh, the cause of biodiversity loss and uh, its uh, remedy? So is uh, Homo sapiens uh, a sort of uh, pharmacon, which is at the same time a poison and a medicine. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I think that I have finished this. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Elena. Um, very interesting talk. Um, and now uh, Fernando Valladares will continue with his uh, scientific uh, perspective on the same topic, I think, similar. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thanks for the invitation. And, and thanks to Elena for a wonderful introduction to the history of the concept, biodiversity, and all the, the implications. I will try to follow up on some of her ideas. Let me share the screen. So basically the title of my presentation goes into the ecological basis of planetary health. And uh, I'm not going to enter into the details of the impact of human beings on the environment or on the planet, but uh, I will reflect on three threats to our health and welfare, and eventually even our survival, that three things, three problems are um, really uh, making these threats uh, very, very, very uh, remarkable. The climate change, pollution and pandemics, the three of them are both important and timing and they interact quite a lot. And 
let me make a little reflection on, on about health. A few years ago, or till recent times, when we think about health, human health, we think about risk of heart attack, cholesterol, cancer, or diabetes. But nowadays, we are all wearing these face pieces, uh, these filtering face pieces, and this is a realization that the environment is actually a threat, or environment is uh, having an extra dimension on our health and our welfare. Uh, in fact, we know for long that many uh, illnesses and many uh, diseases and problems do have an environmental signal. And for instance, in the childhood cancers, 80%, that is mm, most of them, do have a signal on the environment. We have, let's say, direct experiments. So the healthier the environment, the better for us. But we have, um, well, we have the reverse experiment. When, when something that is bad in environmental terms, when uh, the atmosphere is polluted, uh, the, the reverse of this situation actually improves our health. So it's, a, it's, a, it's another evidence that the, our health is connected to the environment. The examples that I'm bringing here, both are from China. And, and I bring that on purpose because China is really uh, at the very center of our concern, both in terms of global emissions and climate change, both in biodiversity, in economics, in many aspects, in the global uh, politics. And, and, and also in China, as you know, the COVID-19 got the starting point. So China in 2008 was appointed to, to host the Olympic Games. And as you may remember, those Olympic Games were threatened by the air pollution of uh, particularly the city of Pekin. And the government took a strong uh, commitment to keep the program and they made a, a very urgent program and plan to clean the atmosphere. And as a consequence of that, the Olympics took place. And also the Chinese babies gained 24 grams in weight after the application of these anti-pollution measures. And again, now this year, uh, after two months of um, a confinement uh, due to the COVID-19 in China, uh, Professor Mark Marshall Burke uh, of the University of Stanford calculated that about 4,000 children under the age of five and 73,000 adults over the age of 70 have been saved because of the decreased contamination. So all these things actually are be behind the concept of planetary health, a, a topic that may sound too huge, too global, too general, but it's actually making quite a lot of sense. The F Rockefeller Foundation and the, and the scientific journal, The Lancet, launched the concept already five years ago. And as you know, the World Health Organization is, is taking good care of these uh, uh, close connections between environment, between the health of animals and plants, and between uh, the health of human beings. They are uh, close connections among all of them. And we can only talk about one single health, health and the panels, the works of experts, the workshops should put together experts from different uh, areas and not only uh, doctors in the traditional or standard medicine uh, research or uh, activity. The worst of our health is when we die. So it's interesting to have a little reflection on what do we die of? And as you know, there are three main illnesses that cause most of the, of the uh, casualties every year. So um, cardiovascular diseases with 18 million people dying every year, cancers with almost 10 million people dying every year, and respiratory diseases with uh, 4 million people dying every year are the three main uh, threats to us. But I would like to show you in this, uh, in this graph, like uh, those that are in the middle, for instance, malaria, uh, or for instance, AIDS, or tuberculosis, uh, they are around a million 
casualties or uh, people dying every year. And I'm pointing to this because it's just to put into perspective the COVID-19. As you know, COVID-19 is causing about 1.3 and 1 million people dying in about a year. So this is where uh, COVID-19 will be ranked. My main point today is that most of these causes of uh, death uh, are actually related to the environment, to the health of the environment, to the level of conservation or the um, uh, well-functioning of the ecosystems. <clears throat> For instance, we know that climate change kills uh, and, and, and the World Health Organization has calculated that this year the, a quarter of a million people will die directly because of climate change. But indirectly, the number of casualties will be dozens of millions of people. And this is because climate change is at the heart of many human activities. Uh, climate change affects directly when it is uh, uh, involving severe weather, uh, injuries and fatalities, but also mental health impacts. The air pollution that is very connected to climate change is causing asthma, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory allergies. But for instance, the global warming is changing the vector ecology and, and some infectious diseases like malaria, dengue, uh, Lyme disease, etc., are spreading. Uh, the water quality, the water availability, the food supply are affected by climate change and in turn, indirectly, uh, they are causing millions of deaths every year. And we need to remember the forced migration. Half of the population uh, or half of the movements of our species, millions of people moving around the world, are pushed by changes in, in the climate. And the interactions, which are very common, which is a concept that is almost always present in the mind of an ecologist, interactions among factors, interactions among processes, do take place in things related to our uh, health. And for instance, pollution and COVID-19 are very related. A study in the United States revealed that just a little increase in pollution uh, increased significantly the number of deaths. Just uh, being uh, breathing only one microgram per cubic meter of small particles uh, a few months before the COVID-19 increased by 15% the number of casualties. And similar studies were found in Italy and in other places. Now that we are talking about pandemics and we are very concerned about pandemics, let me show you specifically for pandemics, these connections among nature, ecosystem functioning and our health. The origin, the origin of infectious diseases has, has moved from temperate zones to tropical zones. Uh, in the mid uh, century, 20th century, uh, as, as it is shown in the map in the upper part, we see all these red points showing the emerging infectious disease events. And many of them took place in temperate zones of North America and Central Europe. As we destroy the ecosystems in other areas, as we move the destruction of the environment to tropical areas because we had uh, an increased technology and uh, also an increased hunger of resources, we move to the tropics and now the infectious diseases, as you can see in the lower map, are coming from tropical areas. What are the relationships between pandemics and biodiversity? There are many, and I will summarize them in three main groups, and the three groups actually uh, of, of, of connections and, and mechanisms do involve the three uh, main types of biodiversity. The, the big co uh, grain, the coarse grain biodiversity refers uh, to the functional groups, to the types of um, the, the life strategies of the organisms, predators, herbivores, uh, cold-blooded, uh, warm-blooded, or in plants uh, when the leaves are um, perennials or deciduous, all these different strategies, these uh, groups of species. When there are high levels of diversity at this high level of uh, uh, ecosystem structure, then the, the, the mechanisms of population control makes uh, very little chances for the pathogens to actually hit the human beings. Why? Because of the network of life, all these interactions between uh, among species, they compete, 
they need each other, they, they actually regulate the populations of all the other species, and some of these species are actually holding or hosting uh, pathogens. So the fact that uh, all these interactions take place reduces the risk for the dangerous species to become out of control and to increase in demographic numbers and, and be a risk for human beings. This is the main and the first uh, regulation uh, uh, mechanisms of biodiversity. The second one is a more uh, detailed one and is called the dilution effect. Uh, when several host species that are similar, for instance, rodents, or for instance, birds, when they coexist and there is high levels of biodiversity, the overall uh, amount of uh, pathogens uh, decreases because not all the species sharing the pathogen are equally positive or good for the pathogen. And the, and the uh, accumulated results is the dilution of the pathogen. Uh, so the more species, the lower prevalence of the, of the illness and the less and the lower risk for the illness to come to, to the human beings. And the third mechanism is the lowest and more detailed level of biodiversity, the genetic diversity, the diversity within a species. The fact that we all uh, suffer, for instance, COVID-19 in different ways the, uh, is, is due to our health, our age, but also to our genetic uh, information, to our genetic composition. So the more diverse a species is, the more buffering, and this is the name of the mechanisms, the buffering effect uh, of uh, this uh, uh, fine grain level of diversity. And I'm going to illustrate these different uh, mechanisms with examples. So for instance, the, 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 the coarse grain biodiversity protection uh, against illnesses uh, can, be, uh, can be seen in this study of wild boars, wolves, and animal tuberculosis three species, so the predator are the wolves, the, the, the species, the, the target species is the wild boar, and the pathogen in this case is the animal tuberculosis. The study was carried out in Spain, but after several years of field data, uh, a, a group of British mathematicians uh, ran some models and made some calculations, and the conclusions were pretty clear. The number of wild boars per hectare remained constant whether they were wolves or not. But the fact that they were wolves in some places decreases the prevalence of the, of the illness. When the wild boar is controlled by wolves, many of the, of the wild boars were not infected. When the pathogen itself, when the tuberculosis is the one controlling the populations, actually the, the prevalence of the illness was very high. <clears throat> And we can move uh, to an example on the other case, in the case of uh, the dilution effect I was showing to you that involves uh, um, a finer grain biodiversity, the number of species of the same functional groups. For instance, with the, with the West Nile virus disease that was very much of a concern in Spain, for instance, this summer, because there were some, some events in, in Guadalquivir Valley that actually caused the, the casualties, five or, or so casualties. This, this, this virus is, uh, is, is being uh, host by birds and it requires a vector, um, typically a mosquito, that actually move it to the humans. But uh, the, the, the um, spillover of humans to humans or the contagions of humans to humans is not possible. You always need a mosquito to bring the virus from the birds to the animals. And in this study that I'm bringing here that was done almost 20 years ago in the United States by Osfeld and co-workers, they, they show uh, that the impact of this virus, the West Nile virus on humans decreased sharply because the graph is actually logarithmic, uh, decreased sharply uh, with the increase in bird biodiversity. So the, the, richest, the richer the communities of birds, the lower the impact of the virus in the human uh, society or communities. We know after some uh, recent reviews, like for instance, this one by Jeeves and, and, and co-workers that was published a few months ago uh, on an extensive database that degraded areas are mm, 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 the, 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 there are more fauna 
excuse me, there are more fauna hosting zoonoses in degraded areas. So they, they went collecting data from birds, uh, rodents, uh, all sorts of mammals, and even other uh, groups like amphibians or reptiles. And, and they, they, they came with graphs like these ones, showing that the more degraded uh, the, the, the study site, the, in, the larger the number of species having uh, been host of zoonoses. Uh, for instance, for, for birds in the left uh, graph, you can see in brown the dots increasing. Uh, uh, so species hosting zoonoses were increasing in degraded areas, while the reverse was true for non-host in green dots. So the, the birds <coughs> non-hosting uh, zoonosis were decreasing. And the same was observed for other groups of animals as well. A recent, well, not that recent, but last year a study by Halliday and, 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 and colleagues and co-workers showed um, uh, the time effect of biodiversity because there were some studies with uh, a little conflicting results and, and there were some, uh, some situations where biodiversity effects on, on, on prevention of, of infections was not that clear. And actually the study by Holiday, which was also experimental, not only observational, uh, uh, explained why these discrepancies. Well, initially, some places with high biodiversity could have also high infection levels. But over time, uh, high biodiversity places uh, are uh, leading to low infection levels. The more species there are in the community, time after time is causing a decrease of the infection levels. While the initially low biodiversity uh, sites or situations may have low levels of infections initially, but eventually over time, they will have high levels of infections. So this is a proof of the dilution effect that I was showing before, but uh, with this time, uh, time dimension that is so important to understand processes that are as dynamic as infections. It is also important uh, to conserve the, 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 the structure of the ecosystems. For instance, the fragmentation of the ecosystems uh, can actually speed up the zoonosis. In this study that I'm bringing here, the, the study was done in the United States with the Lyme disease that is carried by, by ticks. So the number of infected ticks decrease with the size of the forest fragment. So large forest fragments do hold less infected ticks. And no surprise for ecologists, climate change and infections interact. We know that uh, warming weather increases the range of vectors like ticks or mosquitoes. But a recent study by Cohen and co-workers has shown a direct effect of climate change and warming on the pathogens themselves. In the graphs shown below, uh, we, we can see the performance uh, of, the, of the pathogen in red, over the performance over a range of temperatures in red, and the performance of the host species in blue uh, over a range of temperatures. And as you can see, typically the pathogens do have a broader optimal uh, performance across temperatures. And this broader uh, range of temperatures actually uh, it makes that while animals from temperate and cold ecosystems will be having more and more risks of infectious diseases uh, with uh, climate change and warming in particular. <clears throat> Monica Green made an interesting analysis a few months ago on the, she's a historian and, and she made a, the contribution that and, and, and illustrated very well the fact that we put too much emphasis on studying the pathogen, while most of the pandemics cannot be understood by the pathogen, by, by the conditions, the circumstances, both the ecology and both the historical and social so, uh, conditions of human beings. Without understanding the context, we don't understand the pandemics. And, uh, in fact, she found that infections that use our networks were the ones that were successful and illustrated with a number of situations and, and, and combined paleogenetics with history and social uh, trends and dynamics of our society. And for instance, the cholera 
found its first success in the Ganges River because of the local customs. But then the British uh, made a lot of canals and infrastructure and their transcontinental movements carried the infection around the world. Sorry that this is in Spanish, but I think you can get the main message. The, the main message is that behind a pandemia, a pandemics, there are many, many processes. Many of them are ecological processes. Many of them has been illustrated already by the extinction of species, fragmentation of the forest. Also, um, wet markets, illegal traffic of species, the climate change, and also the impoverishment, impoverishment of the genetic uh, uh, of the host, the, the genetic impoverishment of the host of many of the viruses and zoonoses. No? And we, we may think about the, the, the places where porks and birds are raised in industrial uh, infrastructures, the genetic diversity of those uh, uh, installations and those communities and those populations is very low. So the protection provided by genetic diversity within a species is almost lost in those uh, uh, industrial um, production of meat, actually. Just, uh, I'm coming to the, to the end, but I wanted to make um, a, a reflection on the, uh, on the economics of all this. Why? Because, well, mm, the economics is right be, uh, at the core of the problems. And it is economics uh, that may make it uh, a lot of sense to actually prevent and conserve nature. For instance, Dobson in another recent and interesting paper estimated the global costs of pandemics and compare the, the cost of preventing pandemics with the cost of the current COVID-19 pandemics. The three key prevention measures that they, they uh, assess were halting deforestation in tropical areas, limiting trade in species, and establishing an early warning and control network for pandemics. With these three prevention measures, they estimated that the cost will be around, uh, around eight and, uh, uh, excuse me, 17 and 27 trillion dollars. Uh, oh, there is a mistake here. There are trillion and trillion, sorry. Uh, there is a mistake, uh, but I can show you, I don't care about the exact numbers. The, the, the idea is that uh, preventing the pandemic uh, cost billions of dollars with B, while the cost of only the COVID-19 cost trillions with T. So orders of magnitude more expensive to take care of only just one pandemic like COVID-19 than actually to preventing them all with a well-preserved nature. We can put many other examples. For instance, the Waldron report that was published uh, at the beginning of this summer, uh, they analyze uh, the, 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 how profitable it can be protecting the earth. Mm, they, they, in the graph below, in blue, you can see the costs uh, of uh, in, implementing uh, di six different conservation programs versus the current situation. They go for duplicating the protected areas from 15% to 30%, and, and, and this obviously has a cost in blue, but you can see the incomes and the benefits in yellow or in orange. And if you take the multiplication factor by tourism, you can see that the benefits are significant. So even in economic terms, uh, it makes a lot of sense to invest in nature to protect ourselves. No? Actually, nature is the vaccine. We are so concerned with the vaccine nowadays, uh, with the vaccine for the COVID-19, and this vaccine is going to be late. Actually, a uh, uh, 1 million and 1.3 million people late. And it will be only useful for one single pathogen. And we know that there are many hundreds or thousands of potential pathogens and actually the pathogens do mutate. So the vaccine might not be useful in the long run. And my last reflections are about the socioeconomic systems. It does not work. We all know that. It generates serious and costly environmental problems in the face of which there is no technology to stop them. It generates millions of preventable deaths, premature deaths that could be avoided with a better uh, nature and, a, and, and an environment of a different nature. It causes social crisis, tensions and war conflicts that are increasingly dangerous at the global level. Obviously, all this relies on the incorrect, scientifically incorrect notion that resources are infinite, which makes obviously the current socioeconomic systems unsustainable. 
So we think that we are sick from COVID-19, but in reality, we suffer from a much, much more serious illness. Pandemics, climate change and pollutions are the symptoms of a society sick with unsustainability. Thanks. Thank you very much to, to both uh, speakers. Um, I would like to, to ask uh, people in the audience or other speakers of other sessions whether they have comments or, or questions for Elena and Fernando. We are well in time, thanks to Antonio who was, <laughs> who was quick in, in, in removing the, the, the coffee time we had before. So, Well, in, in the mint, is, is there someone who wanted to ask a May question? I? Yes, please, May Martha. I? Thank you. Thank you, you both, uh, for uh, this last session. Uh, it's really integrating and complementing all the other sessions, I think. Uh, I, I have a question sometimes uh, for Elena first, uh, but I will be happy to listen <laughs> for uh, you both uh, if, uh, if, yeah, if you wanted to. To contribute. The, the question, Elena, is uh, that uh, um, I think that uh, the, it's really important the point you made uh, talking about biodiversity and the normative content uh, that this notion actually brings with it anytime we use it. And it has been historically and philosophically developed precisely because of this normative, right, uh, uh, dimension. So, my question is, what happens, what do you think <laughs> that might happen, right? If we apply this, the notion of biodiversity as you are framing it to the different levels that we have been dealing with today, talking uh, of cancer. Because I think that uh, the normative dimension is very much related also with uh, ontological or even metaphysical aspects, right? And uh, the question, what is actually relevant uh, in scientific terms, uh, and I'm using on purpose the language that uh, one of the speakers this morning from the scientific field use, right? This, what is relevant uh, in scientific terms at these different levels. So from, for example, tumor heterogeneity in terms of genetics or tumor heterogeneity in terms of different tumors in different people, right? or a tumor or a heterogeneity is, and so biodiversity at, a, at a, an environmental level and at the human social level, which is also very important. And you, you uh, yeah, maybe this is a big, big issue, <laughs> but if you, if you can help me to foresee how we could use and apply the same concept to these different levels that, in my opinion, have different normative criteria and reference. I, I really have, I, I really should think about that for uh, giving um, um, an answer. Um, I don't know if, if, it, if it would be, uh, if it, if it, it would have a positive effect in, in, this, in, in this sense. That uh, um, the term biodiversity has also been uh, criticized a lot uh, exactly because uh, um, it is a normative one. Yeah. And uh, because it is used in so many contexts and for so many discourses that the risk is uh, that it becomes an empty word. Okay, so uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, scientists have criticized uh, uh, biodiversity as an empty shell where everyone can put it uh, what they want, as uh, um, a, a word that a concept that should be left to, let's say, social scientists rather than. Uh, uh, eco a real ecology, rather than ecologists or biologists, or um, like, uh, um, yeah, so that, that is the criticism, and actually they are, they, those are the criticisms, and actually there are also suggestions of, uh, let, let's say, eliminativism, mm -hmm. so the idea that uh, conservation biology would, would make better without uh, um, the term biodiversity. Um, 
so I'm not sure that applying it to different uh, um, subjects could do a good job. I'm not sure. Okay. Even though, of course, I, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, diversity is a word that you can apply to everything, right? Um, so in the case, for instance, say you speak about uh, uh, sex diversity or genes diversity, et cetera, et cetera, those are all levels of biodiversity because we spoke uh, also, um, Fernando spoke about the, the three main levels that are usually considered. So uh, genes, uh, species and uh, um, ecosystems. But uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of intermediate levels. So you can speak about uh, biodiversity uh, on concerning I don't know, uh, cells, the molecules, uh, uh, or uh, landscapes, uh, or uh, what have you. But um, yeah, I don't know how much you can extend that uh, without extend the word and the concept without uh, um, and, and maintaining the normative force. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I should think about that. We can no, think about that. This, no, this helps. Uh, I, um, it's work in progress, as you said, right? But uh, for me, and maybe Arancha herself uh, can contribute to this question, but uh, probably going uh, um, or reflecting on the Aristotelian notion of dif differentia mm -hmm. could be a good way not to enlarge the concept, uh, but to um, focus on what is essential to the concept itself uh, and that can be useful. Yeah, that would be an, a nice uh, path. It's my, my way of, uh, and I'm more yeah. than interested in following your work or whatever, if possible, on this. Thank, I don't want to take more time. Thank you. Thank Ara. you for your question. Fernando, I don't know if you wanted to add something or... <laughs> well, from, from the scientific point of view, I think uh, we always want to, to take the semantics as clean, as clear, as straightforward as possible. And I understand and I, and, and, and I agree with Elena and with you that sometimes the word biodiversity has been used in a very broad way and with different, mean, different implications and meanings. And sometimes there is a risk of deploying the actual meaning of biodiversity. But you can always go back and you can apply a sensu stricto biodiversity or a sensu lato biodiversity. And then the, the debate is over. And if we, if you go to biodiversity sensu stricto, um, the, the 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 amount of information, the scientific knowledge, the the laws, the mechanisms, the process, the hypothesis, all of them are organized, are available, are in Wikipedia. You can check them, or if you can go to an expert for the last state of the art knowledge on on the implications. I think for for us, especially in the context of a, a human health. It is important to, to take the, the, the general processes that uh, biodiversity is involved in and see whether, as you suggest, Marta, they apply at, uh, and they work at different levels. That is an interesting exercise. But I think there are levels at which the scientific uh, evidence is very strong. And then it might be interesting, useful, and, and enriching uh, to see whether they apply to other uh, definitions more broad of biodiversity and whether this exercise can actually enrich other disciplines or can make uh, our view of the, the functioning of biodiversity and the um, uh, healing effect of biodiversity, if you want, or whatever implications of biodiversity can be um, also interesting to, to see with this broader perspective. Thank you very much. Or questions? Well, I, I would like to to do a comment on, on the on the contrast, uh, the difference uh, Elena was uh, mentioning of that uh, Sarkar uh, um, proposes between the ameliorative and the preventive, because and I, I think this um, concerns um, both the both of the talks we we heard um, uh, in the third session and also. The two, the two ones that we heard in the second session, because um, you know, as uh, Canguillem used to to remember Leris' uh, um, sentence that health is the life in the silence of the organs. So when we live in in health, we we don't uh, hear the cry of the flesh. Uh, we don't uh, hear the the problem of disease. But when disease comes, 
then all kinds of uh, um, attempts to, to talk of uh, prevention seem to be too, too late. Or that's one problem, or, or maybe then we, as a, as a, as a species, we, we have to really overcome the individual uh, framework and think of uh, that uh, we are entangled in, in many, many interactions. So how would you, would you think of this problem of, of, the, of the us, of the, the need to, to find cures and ameliorative uh, policies uh, or uh, medicine? And and the and the and the philosophical and scientific uh, um, awareness that the problem is uh, before before and that we have we have to prevent uh, those diseases to to start. So the question is for the four speakers, <laughs> if, if you want to to engage with it. Um. Who, who wants to get started? I mean, there are, you, you open quite several interesting potential answers to, to your question. I, th I think there are two scales, the individuals and the populations, uh, and, and this is important. As you, as you said, uh, especially in an infectious disease like COVID-19, the, the group and the population is probably the, the right scale to, to think about biodiversity and prevention. You know? But at the individual level, we may think more on the on the amelioration side of biodiversity. And actually, there are many many uh, uh, pieces of evidence showing how uh, biodiversity actually improves our mental health and actually our, our physiological health. No, uh, individually speaking, so. Probably, depending on, on the type of uh, threat to our health, we may be uh, using uh, or shifting or moving from the prevention to the amelioration uh, sides of the biodiversity influence on our health. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have an answer again, uh, since I mean, uh, you, you, you asked the question in the sense that uh, we are here speaking about uh, um, these uh, kind of uh, issues that somehow concern uh, our generations uh, and our generation and the future ones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, in a way, we are all agreeing that something should be done, uh, and that uh, human health uh, is uh, connected with uh, the um, with the environment, and that our activities are threatening the. Let's, let's call it with a metaphor, the health of the environment and so on and so forth. But uh, the, the, the ultimate, uh, really the ultimate effect is, uh, uh, was, uh, the, 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 was, was mentioned in the, according to me, in, in the last slide uh, um, of uh, Fernando Soak, uh, the, the point is that our system is not sustainable and it is based uh, on, uh, uh, on this idea, which is false, that uh, resources are, in, uh, are endless. They are mm -hmm. not endless. Um, so the, the point is that we can, as a singular uh, individuals, of course, we can act, try to act on ourselves. So for instance, uh, having, a, um, I don't know, pursuing a better lifestyle and trying to um, do our best, so to speak. But, uh, but uh, actually, uh, I, I think that a change of perspective uh, uh, from a societal point of view is needed. Uh, and that I don't know if can, uh, I don't know if the, uh, let's say, individual uh, consciousness uh, or um, can, can be enough, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say a revolution, but uh, um, no, in, um, it's it's really the big issue, I think. Also, because we have the data, we know it, but mm -hmm. uh, how can we translate that knowledge into um, a societal change, right? Sorry. Yep. Yeah. I just would like to to raise the attention to one one issue that. Um, biodiversity itself means very little to our health. It's the functioning biodiversity that actually has profound implications. 
And uh, biodiversity are the pieces of uh, the machine. Uh, and the machine may still not work even if you have all the pieces. So biodiversity is a requisite, but it's not enough. We need a function in ecosystem to perform the services and the functions that eventually prevents our uh, problems, uh, health problems, or that improves our individual health. And the functioning of the ecosystems involves, for instance, the interactions that I was mentioning. And, and you may have the species, but they may not interact. Or you, you may have the species and they may not uh, carry out the biogeochemical cycles that we need so much. So actually it's the functioning, the, the, the functioning biodiversity, the, the one that has implications for our, our health. No? And, and it's not enough to have the pieces. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, for instance, what we, there has been this, uh, um, uh, I know that uh, um, pollinators uh, have been artificially produced, uh, right? Mm -hmm. built. They are uh, robo-bees or something like that, because we, we are afraid of uh, losing um, pollinators. Mm -hmm. Okay, And uh, if we lose pollinators, uh, like uh, a, a very huge amount of ecosystem services, of ecosystem services is uh, at risk. And so we uh, built um, robot pollinate that, that can pollinate. Okay. Mm. In that case, uh, maybe the system uh, would work uh, all the same, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, you cannot know that on the long term because it would depend on our assistance and on our maintenance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So, do you think uh, in this case that? Uh, Mm, I mean, nature biodiversity, if it, it, if it still exists, is actually more, um, let's say, is actually more functional than, uh, let's call it an integrated artificial and na mm -hmm. natural biodiversity, just from the functional point of view. Yeah, I, I think so. I think uh, there are many examples when uh, we humans make artificial uh, copies of uh, real complex ecosystems, they do perform some of the functions. For instance, in the example that you put with the pollinations, we may replicate the pollination function, but a pollinator performs at the same time several functions. And this complexity is very difficult to do with artificial means. In, mm. in general, when we uh, enter into the ecosystems and we do things, we either make a pollinator or reintroduce a species, we don't reintroduce all the functions uh, sometimes because the system is much more complex. The fine tuning of the interaction uh, is the result of uh, thousands of years of evolution, of yeah, co-evolution of many individuals. And it's very hard to replicate that. Obviously, sometimes you, you are forced and you can only do that, right? But yeah. in, it's like, like a hunting, no? You, you can reduce the number of herbivores in a protected area, for instance, when there are too many herbivores and they, they, they are destroying the plants. Yeah, but it's not exactly the same role as a predator. The predator actually is, is checking for the weakest animals and, and actually the hunters go for the strongest animals. So uh, you don't do the same by hunting uh, and as the predators do in natural. So typically it's, it's a simplification of a complex situation. Sometimes it's the only option, but in general, the, the thing is that each species, each individual performs several functions and it's very difficult to, to replicate all this complexity. Of course, the, the, the growth of a human population is a, a huge uh, variable to take into account uh, here, right? Mm -hmm. Also in uh, the pandemic situation, for instance, the fact that uh, we, uh, we are a lot and we live uh, uh, in uh, we live close to each other, etc., mm -hmm. etc., and uh, of course also for sustainability, the fact that uh, uh, human population is uh, growing at an impressive uh, rate. Uh, um, I mean that has, uh, I think, uh, a strong impact. Of course, that sure. that shall be. Uh, of course, we shall also consider the the social differences. Uh, not all uh, uh, human mm -hmm. beings. Uh, have the same ecological footprint, right? Sure. Depending on where you live, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I mean, do you think that uh, the growth of a human population is actually um, um, a very serious factor to consider when thinking about uh, 
the global, let's call it global health of uh, mm -hmm. our species mm -hmm. and the planet. I, I think so. And uh, actually, it's, it's, it's adding a lot of pressure. Uh, the, the typical question that sometimes you get is how many people can, can be uh, living in the planet, no? And there is room for more people, uh, for sure. There are many models that can estimate that a couple thousand million of people are still possible in our planet. But the more people you have, there are, uh, in parallel, two, two problems, two tensions. One is just per se, the consumption, the, 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 the pressure on, on resources. But in the case of, for instance, uh, dynamic situations like a contagious and infectious disease, then it gets more complicated to control the global, mm. the, the global implications. So it, it, it basically reduces your degrees of freedoms. Uh, it, it decreases the, your capacity to actually uh, control or take decisions. So the more people you are, uh, the, the hardest, for instance, to achieve governance. The governance, uh, uh, when, when the populations are small and very regional, uh, the governance is achievable. Nowadays, we are in facing a challenge of a global governance of a huge population. So the more people, the more pressures on uh, social stability, economic stability, ecological stability. It doesn't mean that it's not possible. It doesn't mean that you, we have necessarily to reduce our population, but it actually makes things much more uh, complicated. Mm -hmm. But it's very important the per capita, the per capita footprint. And there is a lot that can be done on that. And, and th there is much hope on improving this than uh, in reducing the demographic trend of our species. Mm -hmm. Although our species is not increasing as much as it used to 20 or 30 years mm -hmm. ago, but it's still increasing. And there are mm, a, a lot of hopes in the uh, individual footprint. And there is a lot that can be done on that, changing our priorities, changing our lifestyles, mm -hmm. Uh, and the society, how the society is arranged. Uh, so we can be the same or more uh, with less of an impact on biodiversity, on functioning, on mm -hmm. conservation, I think. Let's hope so. Okay, I would like to invite uh, some Sorry. last comments. If someone, well, uh, if there aren't any more comments, we can finish uh, here. Uh, on completely on time. Mm -hmm. uh, Antonio, you Anita, want to ask something? Yes, uh, thank uh, uh, Before finish, finishing, uh, I would like to, to say a few words uh, by way of farewell, OK? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I would like uh, uh, to thank the speakers uh, for the excellent contribution. Uh, I would like also to thank uh, the CENIO and especially uh, Maria Blasco and her collaborators uh, for once again uh, taking the initiative of in organizing the workshop. And also, also I would like to, th to thank uh, the Banco de Sabadell Foundation for their sponsorship. And finally, uh, I would like to thank uh, all the virtual assistance for connecting with us this morning. Uh, I completely agree what you said at the beginning of the workshop, Arancha. Uh, I believe that uh, this, uh, this type of activities that connect uh, science uh, with humanity and particularly uh, with uh, philosophy are important and increasingly necessary. Uh, scientific research, needs a close connection with society, uh, which uh, the human humanities can facilitate and promote uh, at least uh, at some, some extent. And philosophy need, uh, needs to be in permanent contact with science, uh, with the advance, advances uh, of science, uh, so as not to lock itself in a self-referential self uh, discourse. So we need a, a humanized a science and a philosophy that is uh, really, as the German philosopher Hegel said, its own time comprehended in thought. So thank you, uh, you all very much, uh, uh, and uh, see you at the next uh, edition of the workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you all. 
you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much to you all. Thank you.